Section twenty of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Sylvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter twenty. Under the hooded mask. What had happened? By way of what mysterious adventures had the corpse of sugar refiner Tomery reached that empty room in Rue Le Corbe, where Jerome Fondor had come across it? two days previous on the afternoon of elizabeth dollon's arrest monsieur thomery was working in his study when a servant came to tell him that a lady wished to speak to him did she give you her name asked thomery no monsieur this person said her name would tell you nothing but she was sure monsieur would see her for she would only detain him a minute or two piles of papers were stacked on the great sugar refiner's study table typists were laying numerous letters before him which awaited his signature thomery thought to himself i have still a good half hour's work before me deuce take this importunate visitor he was on the point of saying he could not see any one when the servant added this person declares she comes with reference to madame de princess danada though he was a man of business thomery was a gallant man also and very much in love his approaching marriage with the princess which had been kept secret was now known the name of princess danidoff settled the question very well let her come in the man-servant disappeared a minute then ushered into the study a very unassuming woman of uncertain age and quite ordinary looking thomery rose to meet her pointing pleasantly to one of the large armchairs in the room the visitor was profusely apologetic i am so exceedingly sorry monsieur thomery to disturb you at such an hour when you must certainly have a great deal to occupy your attention but the matter i have come about will not wait and i am sure it will interest you this little person seemed very intelligent and thomery was favourably impressed by her manner which was both simple and decided madam i am listening to you in what way can i be of service to you i am not here monsieur she protested to pester you with any wants and wishes for myself i am a diamond broker and she had not finished her sentence when thomery smiling but firm rose and said sharply in that case madam i guess the motive of your call but monsieur yes that is so ever since my approaching marriage has been announced i have received every day a dozen visits from jewellers goldsmiths upholsterers and so on i regret to have to tell you that you will not be able to persuade me to buy that my betrothed has received so many wedding presents that there is no room for more i do not require one single thing although thomery had spoken in a tone which did not admit of any reply although he had risen the better to mark his intention of cutting short the call the diamond broker had remained seated leaning back in her armchair she gave no sign of being ready to go away consequently madam continued thomery his visitor laughed ah, sure you have very quickly made up your mind that i have nothing interesting to offer you i have not come to offer you ordinary jewels it was thomery's turn to smile slightly i quite understand madam that you should think your merchandise exceptional but once more the broker interrupted the sugar refiner with a movement of her hand do listen to me a moment monsieur though i am a diamond broker diamonds are not what i have come to ask you to purchase it is a question of something quite different she paused deliberately thomery gazed at her without saying a word you know monsieur continued the broker that in such a business as mine one is obliged to see a great many jewellers every day well in the course of my peregrinations i found at a jeweller's you must allow me to withhold his name some pearls which i am certain you will find are a wonderful bargain for the last time madam i do not want a wonderful bargain the agent smiled curiously there are some things which simply do not allow themselves to be refused she declared she now drew from her pocket a little jewel case and notwithstanding thomery's unconcealed impatience opened it and selected two pearls which she held out to him do examine these jewels you are going to tell me that they are perfectly beautiful are you not monsieur thomery the diamond broker offered them so naturally that thomery gave way he examined the pearls he was a connoisseur in truth madam these pearls are superb unfortunately i am not enough of an expert to buy them without taking competent advice that is if i thought of acquiring them eventually but i repeat i have no wish to acquire such things 
deuce take it thought thomery this broker won't take no for an answer since i cannot rid myself of her by being pleasant i shall make myself disagreeable but the would-be seller still insisted monsieur you really cannot be a connoisseur otherwise i am sure you would not return these pearls to me but madam and i am convinced that if princess sonya danadoff had had them in her hand instead of you she would have been greatly taken with them the broker had emphasized her words so strangely that suddenly thomery hesitated what did this mysterious visitor mean what was it she considered so extraordinary about the jewels she had just submitted to him a suspicion crossed his mind whence come these pearls madam but at this question the broker got up monsieur thomery declared she i should be very vexed with myself were i to make you lose your evening your time is precious besides in order to give you a proper answer to your question i should have to make certain of facts i now only guess at still i think that without having told you anything definite i have made you sufficiently understand what is in my mind you will not now doubt the interest that the princess sonia danadoff would have were she able to examine these jewels is that so consequently monsieur thomery i am going to ask if you will kindly show these pearls to the princess and then if you will be good enough to let me know what decision you come to jointly with her if you were a buyer i fancy i might let you have these jewels on quite exceptional terms thomery visibly hesitated he was looking at the pearls which he was still holding in his hand and he thought one might swear that these are two of the pearls stolen from sonya at my ball thomery did not reply at once the broker was looking at him with a smile she seemed to guess his thoughts thomery on his side was examining the woman is she simply a police informer he asked himself one of these women who are apparently dealers but are really in the pay of the police and frequent jewellers for the purpose of tracing stolen jewels he was on the verge of asking her who she was but he refrained if this woman had not presented herself under her true colours evidently she wished to pass for an ordinary dealer it was possible that she was really a receiver of stolen goods thomery came to a decision i shall have the privilege of seeing the princess danidoff to-morrow afternoon will you therefore leave the pearls with me i will show them to her should she express the slightest wish to possess them i might possibly come to terms with you dearest it is sweet of you to make no objection to the way in which i obtained this jewel for you to see and to choose for your own if you will the correct thing would have been to ask you to accompany me to some well-known jeweller instead of which i frankly confess that these pearls were offered to me on very advantageous terms if they please you it will give me the greatest pleasure to see them adorning your graceful neck princess sonya laughed my dear for heaven's sake don't worry about such things as that a pearl is not less beautiful because it comes from some unpretentious jeweller's shop i am too fond of jewels for their own sake to trouble about the casket that enshrines them thomery bowed well pleased here then dear sonia are the two pearls entrusted to me as samples please dearest examine them carefully very carefully and if you like them tell me so frankly the princess took the two pearls from the betrothed and crossing the great drawing-room she approached one of the bay windows lifting the thin hangings that she might the better examine the pearls they are marvellous she cried dear sonya you think these gems rarely beautiful indeed i do their lustre is superb their quality their shape perfect why my dear these are the most splendid pearls i have ever seen with one exception the only pearls to equal them are those that were stolen from me the loss of them has been a bitter grief they came to me you know from my dear mother i never thought to find pearls of such quality again you consider these to be of as pure a quality then dear sonya danidoff continued to examine the two pearls it is really extraordinary she cried suddenly do you know my dear there are certain peculiarities about their lustre yes i could swear that these very pearls you are offering me are two of those stolen from me thomery appeared to have been impatiently awaiting these very words you really truly believe sonya that they resemble the pearls stolen from you that unlucky evening i repeat they are identical thomery looked smilingly at sonya i have all sorts of reasons for supposing that they really are two of your own pearls you are now holding in your hand 
and then and there tomary told his fiancée all about the strange visit he had received the evening before as well as his hope that he would be able to recover the stolen triple collar in its entirety that intriguing dealer said he finally must be a police informer in any case i am persuaded that before long she will take me to some receiver or other who is in possession of your pearl collar oh tell me you are not going among such people all alone cried sonia with a note of sharp anxiety in her voice but why not if they are as you think thieves well well don't you see my dear that if you go to buy the pearls they will count on your bringing a large sum of money with you why it would be a most imprudent thing to do tomary shrugged his shoulders really that's nonsense sonia if these assassins meant to set a trap for me they have a thousand other means of doing so besides it would be remarkably daring of them to advise me to show you these pearls and draw my attention to the question of their being stolen ones no sonia this dealer is not the emissary of a band of robbers and assassins she is a police informer who has taken precautions i run no dangerous risks by accompanying her reassure yourself on that point but sonia donadoff was not reassured by tomary's arguments all that only frightens me said she if you do not really think you are running any risk will you let me go with you my dear we will go together to identify those pearls will we not tomary rose to take his leave laughing and protesting why dear sonia it would be in the highest degree improper on my part were i to agree to such a proposition one of two things either there is no danger and i should be very sorry that i had let you go out in such shocking weather or if there is danger i should be still more distressed were i to drag you into it with me i do beg of you sonia do not insist on it i am not a child and i will be very careful very wary shortly after this tomary took leave of sonia donadoff he went straight to the cafe de la paix where he had arranged to meet the diamond broker she was punctual she greeted tomary with her most winning smile i am persuaded monsieur that madame sonia donadoff was interested by the offer you made her quite so replied tomary should we go to your jewellers without further loss of time if you really wish to do so monsieur indeed it would be the best thing to do tomary hailed the cab he and the diamond agent entered it together and she gave the driver an address twenty minutes later they left the cab and were standing before the house where the present possessor of the pearls was to be found tomary knew no more about the person he had come to interview than he did when he started that is to say practically nothing the diamond broker had cleverly evaded giving any direct answers to the sugar refiner's questions she had confined herself to stating what would be the probable price demanded for the pearl collar which question interested tomary least of all they mounted in single file a rather poor sort of staircase on the second floor the woman stopped a narrow door faced them the woman rang they waited someone is coming said the woman i hear footsteps the door was opened halfway who is it asked the man's voice my dear friend answered the woman the door opened wide the same voice said come in monsieur tomary had barely stepped inside the room when the diamond broker who was close behind flung a long silk scarf around his neck and pushing his knee into his victim's back for a support he attempted to give with herculean force the famous stroke of father francis vigazou energetic tomary did not lose his presence of mind he knew that to resist such a pull by simple force was impossible quickly he threw himself backwards thus giving to the strangling pull and falling on top of the woman who had played this dastardly trick on him from his constricted throat came a hoarse ah like a death rattle as he was falling for one flashing second it seemed as though he were going to escape from the vice which was crushing in his throat then out of the shadow there had appeared the fantastic vision of a man in a tight-fitting sort of black jersey which covered him from head to foot his face was concealed by a hooded mask this man leapt out of the shadow he held a dagger in his hand before tomary had time to make a movement the masked man had pierced his chest with a single stroke the sugar refiner was not but a convulsive corpse ah well declared the so-called diamond broker who had got to his feet and was kicking tomary's body aside ah well he is a dead weight this fellow 
by jove master i fancied he was going to crush me and that i should have to let him free you did well to come to the rescue the masked man remarked in an indifferent tone it really does not matter in the slightest tell me does any one suspect no one master he came like a sheep to the slaughter princess danidoff as for her she must be waiting for the return of her beloved friend i do not advise you to pay her a visit be silent chatterbox ordered the masked assassin sharply get rid of your clothes we must hurry we have work to do this evening this evening and whilst the diamond broker rid himself rapidly of skirt and bodice and regained his masculine appearance for this diamond broker was a man the masked assassin added nibet you have played your part perfectly and i will pay you to-morrow the sum we agreed on but i repeat we have work before us this evening so be quick there was a short silence then the bandit asked you have arranged to put among this fool's papers the rent receipts which will enable the police to find this flat yes master good now all we have to do is to get away from this room which we shall not see again until this evening at any rate End of chapter 20 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 21 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 21 in a prison van in one of the rooms reserved for readers of la capitale jerome fandor was gravely listening to madame barat's account of what had occurred at her boarding-house during the night she had rushed off to tell him and to ask his advice what you tell me madame is truly extraordinary said fandor with an air of profound astonishment how did you discover that the police inspector who seized the trunk and carried it away was not a genuine policeman why through the arrival of monsieur Zavi, the police inspector of our district i know him there was no mistaking who and what he was and when i told him that the trunk had been carried off the preceding evening rather in the dead of night he guessed everything and what did he say oh he made us all come to the police station and i can assure you that he looked far from pleased you must admit dear madam that his annoyance was not without reason the police were made fine fools of in this affair but afterwards whom did he take back with him to the police station he took me and my manservant and when you got to the police station well monsieur fandor when we reached the police station he made us come into his office and there he put us through a regular examination just as though he suspected us but there must have been an accomplice in your house who let the robbers in said fandor i do not suppose the false police inspector forced the door open ah but monsieur fandor here is something i do not understand nor does anybody else no they did not try to hide themselves not the least in the world they rang the bell they asked to see me they told me what they had come for and accompanied by my manservant carried away the trunk and had it put in the cab all in the most open and barefaced manner it was your manservant who accompanied them but most certainly and that very fact turned against jules in a very nasty manner poor jules just imagine the police inspector finished by ordering my house to be thoroughly searched from top to bottom and when the policemen returned without a why or wherefore they took jules away to another part of the police station i say i say oh it was all explained as soon as jules had gone the police inspector told me they had found keys in his rooms keys which could be made to fit any kind of lock whatever monsieur zavi was convinced that my poor jules was a burglar imagine it now you yourself madame are convinced of the contrary oh assuredly why i have known jules a very long time and in many little ways on many occasions he has shown himself to be strictly honest but those false keys those false keys monsieur fandor why i myself made jules buy them hoping to find among them one that would open my coach-house so that 
so that monsieur fandor the police inspector was obliged to agree with me that jules was honest and he released the servant of yours asked fandor his tone expressed annoyance no and that is why i am so distressed he said that provisionally at least my servant jules was to be considered as under arrest what ought to be done to get him let out but madam he will be set free to-morrow you may be certain of it no doubt he will all the same there is my house turned upside down and i need jules to help me to-night i really do not know what i shall do without him poor fellow i simply cannot imagine how it is they suspect him fondor said with mock gravity ah madam justice is sometimes so stupid so wrong-headed look here now would you like a bit of good advice telephone to messieurs barbey nantoul they are well known and powerful perhaps they would exert their influence in your servant's favour he might be set free this evening i you see am but a journalist and without a scrap of influence madame bourrat thought this a good idea fondor rang for an attendant take madame to the telephone left to himself the reporter could not help rubbing his hands i must get rid of this excellent woman who is certainly the most foolish person it has ever been my lot to meet good hearing that servant of hers is under lock and key things are going in the right direction but they are not going well for me if he confesses to-morrow when he is had up for examination then the police will have the information before me then too they are such duffers such bunglers that they are quite capable of giving that jules his liberty what the deuce must i do to prevent his being let loose and how am i to stop the judicial interrogation what a dog's life a journalist's is madame bourrat reappeared monsieur nantoul is not there she said but i got into communication with monsieur barbey he advised me to wait till to-morrow he said it was too late in the day to do anything but will he not intervene to-morrow i don't know to tell the truth i am sure monsieur barbey thought it very inconsiderate of me to disturb him about a matter in which he takes not the slightest interest that's a fact what possible interest can the bankers take in such a matter my advice was absurd fondor rose as he was seeing his visitor out he said in any case dear madam count on me to-morrow morning i shall call at your house about eleven if there is anything fresh we can talk it over oh here's jeanson de Selle college oh what detestable remembrances you conjure up but this won't do go it my boy i must play the part the plumber who had just given utterance to these remarks glanced sharply about him when he had made sure that there was no one close on his heels he stepped into the roadway and started on a zigzag course which seemed likely to upset his balance crossing the avenue henri martin going straight towards the town hall at the corner of the rue de la pompe the good plumber who was staggering more than a little began to stutter and stammer in a drunken voice it is the final struggle the passers-by looked around they sing the internationale in the streets now it seems remarked a severe-looking gentleman the workman turned to this correct personage what of it don't you think it a jolly fine thing then in a thick voice he continued to sing let us gather and on the morrow the severe and correct personage spoke my friend you would do better to hold your tongue you forget that there is a police station close by but the incorrigible plumber caught the correct personage by his coat-tails if i sing the international it's because i'm a free man ain't i a free man can sing if he likes can't he eh why don't you sing then eh the correct personage drew himself up stiffly tried to push the obnoxious plumber away the workman had now reached that stage of drunkenness when discussions tend to become interminable the gentleman pushed the drunken man aside saying come come go away leave me alone but the maudlin plumber was attracting the attention of the passers by his gestures he addressed the world at large would you believe it that fellow there don't want me to sing no well i'm going to and he started triumphantly it is the final struggle the policeman came out of the station with a solemn air he put his hand on the tipsy plumber's shoulder in a paternal fashion go along with you my friend come now pass along pass along 
but he could not make the plumber budge before he had finished his verse any more than he could teach him to walk straight on the spur of the moment leaving a hold of the gentleman's coat-tails the worthy plumber seized the policeman's arm oh you're a brother i have education i have you're a workman too i know as the police inspector pushed him off trying to make him go on his way the plumber put his arm around him no no show you're a workman sing with me it is the final the scandal could no longer be tolerated street corner idlers were gathering people were laughing at the policeman strong measures were necessary come now said the policeman yes or no will you be off and go home eh or shall i take you to the station you take me you take me why it would take four of you to take me there was no shilly-shallying after this wounded in his vanity the servant of the law did not hesitate all right said he and seizing the plumber by the collar although there was no attempt at resistance he dragged his prisoner toward the town hall of the district for the police station was there also some more game for the depot said the policeman as he passed the guard a fellow i can't get rid of are the cells full up other policemen came up an arrest in a peaceful district gives interest to the dull routine of the men on duty the cell's full go along with you there's only a small shopkeeper who had no papers thereupon the unfortunate singer who continued to stagger about was quickly pushed into the dark room called the detention room an ordinary everyday incident of the streets this arrest of a drunkard i shall have to write out a report for this fellow said the policeman who had arrested the songster and the salad basket footnote ten prison van passes in an hour's time i shall just do it have you anyone for the depot to-day asked the driver from his high seat on the prison van he was on a collecting journey as is usual every evening when the salad baskets as they are vulgarly called pass to the various police stations of paris to pick up the individuals arrested during the day two of em answered the police sergeant on duty whilst official papers were being interchanged and forms were being filled in according to rule policemen went to the cells to bring out the two prisoners to be dispatched to the depot the first to pass out was the costermonger he was straightway put into one of the narrow compartments in the salad basket then it was the turn of the tipsy and obstreperous workman who was now silent moody and apparently sober of it now cried the policeman come along with you you miserable drunk march now foot it as the drunk hit against the partition of the narrow passageway running up the middle of the salad basket the policeman with a shove pushed him into one of the compartments carefully shutting the little door on him and fastening it my word he exclaimed that fellow wouldn't have been capable of walking three steps in an hour's time as the driver climbed to his seat on the van the policeman called out with a laugh you have a traveller inside who doesn't detest wine it's a pity to see a man in such a hoggish state the same policeman would have been surprised could he have seen the bibulous one's face when the salad basket cast loose from her moorings and started off in the direction of the pont du jour police station the last one on the round to be visited the drunk whom one push had sufficed to plant on his seat had briskly drawn himself upright and was smiling broadly a wide noiseless smile what a joke and what a jolly good actor i should have made thought jerome fandor giving himself a mental hug of satisfaction ah they arrest the individuals i want to set talking the police imagine they are going to push in first and find out the answer to the riddle we shall see fandor was listening intensely and trying to discover from the movements of the salad basket what street they were passing along smooth going evidently we are still on the rue de la pompe so i have about a quarter of an hour more of it fandor examined the tiny cell in which he had been imprisoned of his own free will not much to be said for it ran his thoughts there is scarcely room to sit impossible to stand up or turn around nearly dark and precious little air comes in through those wooden shutters i shouldn't think there ever had been an escape from these vans fandor smiled broadly even if i don't succeed it is worth while making the attempt but i shall succeed see if i don't i settled it in my mind that i was to leave the cells after this costermonger he is in front of me therefore the cell behind me is empty 
it will be deucedly queer if at our two police station they don't put that confounded jules in it whom i intend to interview under the nose of the police i shall start talking to him by tapping on the partition in prisoner's language the fellow is pretty sure to be an old offender so he will know the system if he doesn't when we get to the depot i will push up to him somehow and get a few words with him if the depot is full we shall be stuck into the common cell until morning so i take it as certain that my interview with this true and faithful servant will come off and i shall get to know a good deal about the mystery as an afterthought it occurred to fondor that probably there had never been such a light-hearted occupant of this cell as he ah oh, that's the sound of the trams one jolt two jolts good the rails we are crossing the rue mozart we are going faster in five minutes we shall be at the atu police station and there we can start our little operations there was one thing that attracted fandor's attention which was keenly on the alert there was a violent jolt and he had a distinct impression that the vehicle turned to the right why where the deuce are they taking us fandor asked himself to the boulevard exelmans station we had not reached the end of the rue mozart surely where did we turn then rue de ranelac no there is a channel stone at the entrance and i should have felt it rue de l'assomption again no the roadway is up i should be knocked about more than this on my wooden seat we are going over a perfectly kept road which cannot have much traffic why of course it is rue de dr blanche isn't rue mozart barred at the end yes the driver must be going round by the boulevard montmorency ah well i am in no hurry there will be time enough for me to pay my respects to the illustrious jules just as fondor was thus congratulating himself he was thrown against the side of his cell the van seemed to have come into violent collision with some object and had tilted over to a considerable extent muffled oaths came from neighboring cells a stifled exclamation reached fondor's ears then louder still came the intermittent humming and snorting of a motor-car confound you can't you pay attention to where you're going keep to your right slightly stunned fondor heard someone knocking a voice asked are you hurt no but already the questioner had moved away evidently thought fondor the driver wants to know whether his human packages are damaged or not we have collided with another vehicle cheerful fondor's cell was now at such an angle that he could only suppose that the salad basket had had one of its wheels broken what a nuisance he murmured before they have finished their palaver as to how the accident happened and have repaired the damage we shall have been here a full half hour jules will be in a temper minute succeeded minute long interminable minutes and fondor could not hear clearly what was said what was being done to put the salad basket on its legs again the atmosphere of the little cell was becoming intolerable for the movement of the vehicle had driven fresh air inside the shutter and now that the salad basket was stationary the air was becoming almost unbreathable fondor's nerves were on edge it cannot be that they are going to leave us stranded here thought he ah uh, now they have started repairs fondor noticed that his cell was gradually regaining its ordinary level a lifting jack must have been slipped under the vehicle for there was a melancholy creaking sound they must be putting the wheel on again no thought fondor after some time had passed never would i have supposed that it could have taken so much time to repair a salad basket why we shall soon have been stuck here for two mortal hours i hope it won't make any difference to our going to the depot nor stop my getting into close touch with that villain jules there was a further period of waiting then our exasperated journalist heard the driver pass down the centre of the van the van door slammed once more the salad basket was loosed from its moorings something queer is going on said fondor suddenly he felt certain that the van had turned completely round and was going in the direction it came from now where in the world are we going by what kind of a route are we making for that blessed police station there were spaces of asphalt succeeded by wood pavement then by hard stones then asphalt and wood again and turning succeeded turning whilst the new tom thumb was doing his possible to guess the route the salad basket was taking presently fondor gave it up he had to admit that he was completely lost which way the salad basket was going he knew no more than the man in the moon 
we have been trotting along for more than half an hour therefore we cannot be going to the boulevard exelmans police station the distance from the rue de docteur blanche to the point du jour is not great as fondor was murmuring these words the van slowed down turned around then with a bump and a jolt it mounted the footpath now for it said fondor this is certainly not the pont du jour station we are passing under an archway now we are turning again ah we draw up at last not too soon the van did stop again a wait fondor cocked both ears he wondered who was going to enter the cell next his then a man approached the door of his little cell where he was indeed cribbed cabined and confined inserted a key in the lock opened and shouted in a brutal tone out with you march quick now fondor had no choice but to obey the orders hurled at him but no sooner had he descended the steps of the prison van than he exclaimed by jove the depot this was not the moment to express all the surprise he felt at being landed at police headquarters in this fashion all round the salad basket the police were ranged in irregular order they shouted to him to be quick come on hurry with you hurry there fondor followed by the costermonger was pushed towards a little open door in the grey wall which led into a kind of office where an old frowning man was already looking through the papers which had been respectfully handed to him by a warder so you have brought only two of the birds remarked the frowning official yes superintendent good that will do turning to the warders the frowning little superintendent ordered take them away cell fourteen useless to rouse the whole place once more the warders pushed fondor before them as well as the poor costermonger they were driven into a dark corridor onto which a row of cells opened the head warder opened a door in with you my merry men you will be put through your paces to-morrow as the door fell to with a resounding clang jerome had inspected the place by the light of a lantern empty no luck my plan has been spoiled i shall not be able to interview jules philosophically jerome fondor was preparing to go to sleep on the plank bed which decorated one end of the cell when the little costermonger roused from his torpid condition began to moan and groan oh what a misfortune to think i am innocent innocent as an unborn babe what's to be done oh what's to be done the last thing fondor wished to do was to start a conversation with his lamenting companion he tapped the costermonger on the shoulder good heavens man the best thing you can do is to go to sleep take my word for it without puzzling his brains any further over the enigmas he wished to get to the bottom of fondor stretched himself on his plank bed and was soon sleeping the sleep of the innocent monsieur fusilier looked perplexed you fondor you arrested but am i going mad our journalist had been taken from his cell at eight in the morning and had been conducted to the office of the public prosecutor here the acting magistrate in conformity with the law wished to put him through the examination which would establish his identity all arrested persons have to submit to this interrogation within twenty-four hours of their arrival at the depot jerome fondor had given his name at once and in order to prove the truth of his statements he had asked that monsieur fusilier should be sent for so that the magistrate might vouch for his identity and say a word in his favour monsieur fusilier had hastened to the depot had taken fondor to his office and had anxiously questioned him why he asked had the police been obliged to arrest him for drunkenness in the open thoroughfare when fondor had concluded his statement the magistrate exclaimed your ruse is inconceivable i must compliment you highly on your ability and your detective gifts i wish i could agree with you replied fondor in a depressed tone in spite of everything i have not got into communication with jules but monsieur fusilier have you interrogated him yet the magistrate shook his head alas my poor friend you have no idea of the extraordinary events of the past night evidently notwithstanding the fact that you played a passive part in them i played a part extraordinary events what the deuce do you mean i mean dear fondor that all paris is laughing over it the police have been tricked you have been tricked did you not tell me just now that your prison van had had an accident do you know what really happened i ask you to tell me your vehicle was run into by a motor-car the driver was extremely clumsy or very capable what's that fondor leaned forward keen as a pointer on the scent it was like this replied monsieur fuselier 
your salad basket was very badly knocked about by the collision the driver could not possibly repair it single-handed he telephoned to headquarters help was sent at once and he had orders to drive to the depot as soon as he could he was not to trouble about the boulevard exelmans station that for once could be cleared the following morning unfortunately the telephone messages and replies had taken up a certain amount of time when they telephoned to the boulevard exelmans station from headquarters to warn them not to expect the injured salad basket the depot man who was telephoning was extremely surprised to hear that the salad basket had already passed on to the atul station and had taken away the arrested individuals there notably this famous jules i never calculated on this cried fandor the truth is my dear fellow that salad basket of yours was not knocked out of action by an unlucky accident the knockout was intentional was carefully planned it was done to stop your van from reaching the Autul station while your basket was being repaired another basket appeared at the Autul clearing station this if you please had been stolen it was standing before the palais de justice two accomplices took possession of it and drove away the daring rascals were suitably disguised of course they produced false papers at Autul, got them endorsed went through the regular forms and carried off the men from the detention cells under the very nose and eyes of the superintendent himself what became of the stolen basket snapped fandor it was found at dawn near the fortifications and need i say empty so that jules has escaped as you say and the car which intentionally knocked my salad basket out of action whose was it monsieur fusilier smiled oh it's a queer affair in fact it may lead to the wind-up of all the delon business we may now get to the bottom of that series of crimes you will never guess who is the owner of that car fandor no i am no good at guessing riddles just now besides i hate them fandor was nettled exasperated we got the number of the car from a witness of the smash-up and we have verified its correctness well my dear fellow the owner of that car is Tomery tomery gasped fandor yes i have summoned him to appear before me the summons has just been issued between you and me i think tomery is guilty when he appears here in say an hour from now i shall issue a writ of arrest against this sugar refiner financier and we don't know what else but no sooner had monsieur fusilier finished his statement a statement which he fully expected would strike his young reporter friend dumb with amazement then fandor threw himself back in his chair and roared with laughter the magistrate was taken aback but what the devil do you find to laugh at in that fandor had already checked his hilarity oh it is nothing only fusilier i ask myself if really and truly monsieur tomery who is a very big fellow solidly built has been able to discover a dodge by means of which he can leave jacques dollon's imprints here there and everywhere but he does not leave jacques dollon's imprints because dollon is living because he came to see his sister why you admitted that yourself why of course it's true jacques dollon is alive i had forgotten tomery can only be his accomplice then declared fandor and as monsieur fusilier stared at him astonished at the way he had received the sensational news of the night fandor rose to take his leave my dear fusilier will you allow me to express my opinion monsieur fusilier nodded well i am sure that with regard to this affair there are more surprises in store for us you have not got the answer to the riddle not yet with that fandor smiled and bowed and left the magistrate's room he quitted the palais half smiling half serious what was he going to do next end of chapter twenty one read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com section twenty two of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 22 An Execution. Not much water about, is there? That's so, Olden. If I'd known, it's boats I'd have taken to. Bah, your shoes are big enough. That's not saying it's weather for a Christian to be out in. 
don't grumble old un the more it comes down cats and dogs the fewer stumps will be stirring outdoors but a comrade or two will be on the prowl eh right o old bird keep a lookout sure he'll come this way you bet your nut he will he got my bit of scrawl this morning what then shut up shut up folks coming the night was inky black rain fell with sudden violence threshed and driven by icy gusts of wind the hour was late the rue raffet deserted save for the two men who had ventured out into the tempestuous darkness they advanced with difficulty side by side speaking low rough customers to deal with their faces were emaciated from excessive drinking their eyes gleamed their voices were hoarse a brutal pair but their movements were supple and lively they walked with that ungainly swagger affected by the light-fingered gentry and the criminals of the underground world of paris and what did you say in your scrawl oh meddlers take-ins you know i didn't put my fist into it though who then you ask that i'm no wizard if it wasn't your fist whose then my woman ernestine yes ernestine they struggled on through the squally darkness then one of the two broke the silence you're not jealous beetle making your girl write letters to such folk that sinister hooligan the beetle burst out laughing jealous me jealous of ernestine you make me laugh you really do old beard but beard did not share his companion's mirth he leaned against the palisade to take breath while a little sheltered from the fierce onslaughts of the wind i'll tell you what he said in a gruff and threatening voice i don't like such dodges like those of this evening why so monsieur because after all it's a comrade but he's betrayed a traitor he is but what do we know about it the beetle nodded reflected what does anyone know about it he said at last why when the comrades told us weren't they surprised one and all nibet toulouse even memile they didn't hesitate not one of them well then olden as all the pals were of one mind why hesitate what's the use of discussing but between you and me i don't relish it either it bothers me to go for a pal just then the tempest redoubled its fury it seemed to the cowering men as though all the devils of the storm were galloping down the wind somewhere there was a moon for scurrying clouds were dancing a witch's saraband across a faintly clearer sky the unseen moon was mastering the obscurity of this midnight hour by now the two sinister beings were nearing the rue de docteur blanche they were passing a garden in which tall poplars caught by the squall took fantastic shapes they were nightmare trees terrifyingly strange no more to be said remarked the beetle the scene is set where is the meeting place a hundred yards from there a little before the corner of the boulevard montmorency good and the trap it waits for us a little further off who's aboard it Mamile that's good the two men were now halfway along rue raffet the watch had begun gripped by the cold they waited in silence the minutes passed slowly slowly in the deserted street the beard put his hand on the beetle's shoulder a vague sound could be heard in the distance the steps could be distinguished some pedestrian was coming up the rue raffet in their direction it is he whispered the beetle it is he affirmed the beard he's not over steady on his feet perhaps he's ill shod the two spoke low and in a jesting tone it relieved the painful tension of the moment a comrade was marching to meet his death and theirs the hands to deal that death but not yet it was a reaction against their sense of the looming tragedy of this dark hour now a man's advancing figure could be discerned he came nearer he was plainly by the cut of his garments an indoor servant the collar of his coat was turned up he had his hands in his pockets he walked fast hey you down there the gang cried the beard hailing the oncoming figure ah it's you yes it's me comrade 
and you too beetle as you say what do you want of me since my arrest and escape from the salad basket i'm not anxious to stroll about this neighbourhood out with it the beard said in a joking tone you don't suspect then speak out jules jules for it was indeed he shook his head my word i have no idea what you want who wrote to me this morning ernestine neither the beetle nor beard replied the three men stood talking in the deserted street bending their heads and backs under the rain which was now pouring harder than ever come on then make haste said jules come now tell me what's the point what's up spit it out comrades i don't want to be soaked to the skin you know the beetle forced the pace he lifted his great hairy sinewy hand brought it down heavily on jules shoulder and in a changed voice harsh rough imperative he commanded you must follow us already he had his man fast the unsuspicious jules did not grasp the situation in the least follow you he asked as to that certainly not no more walking for me in such weather wait for us any day say i but whatever is the matter with you eh what why are you sticking out your jaws at me like this out with it my lambs where am i to follow you you won't say monsieur's beetle and beard you won't say beard moved a step and got behind jules unnoticed he repeated in the same tone harsh threatening you've got to follow us i tell you instinctively jules tried to turn around the beetle's strong grip kept him motionless then he understood he was afraid what's come to you he cried in a trembling voice the beetle cut him short enough you will follow us yes or no jules was going to say no but he had not the time quick as lightning the beetle flung a long scarf round his neck stuck his knee into his victim's back and pulled jules uttered a faint groan but half stifled nearly strangled he had not the strength to attempt the slightest self-defence directly he was flung backwards on the ground where he measured his length and lay nearly stunned beard jumped on him knelt on his chest and pinioned him jules lay motionless the beard now began tying up the legs of their victim pass me a scarf there it is olden very good i'm going to apply a be discreet the be discreet of the beard was a gag which he rolled round the servant's head in expert fashion feet firm asked the beard oh jolly fine said the beetle he turned his man over as though he were a bale of goods then he tied his victim's hands behind his back is it far to go to the jaunting car no for two sous that's it a motor car was indeed coming slowly and noiselessly along rue raffet it was a sumptuous car and if it is not he stick him up against the bank dark as it is there's every chance he won't be seen rapidly the doughty two stuck jewels against the bank at the side of the road the unfortunate creature had fainted then they took out their cigarettes and going a few steps away they pretended to be sheltering themselves in order to strike a light they need not have taken this precaution the car stopped in front of them the familiar voice of mimile was heard got the rabbit then yes olden pitch it into the balloon then the balloon questioned the beetle whatever's that emilet laughed at times my brothers your ignorance mechanically speaking is crass the balloon is the back part of my car i'd have you know the beard sniggered good pick it up now beetle the two seized the body of jules by shoulders and feet and flung it brutally into the limousine a rug negligently flung over the body of the trussed jules hid him from observation now we'll embark announced emilet as a precaution the young hooligan asked the bloke snores yes replied the beetle he is travelling in no nightmare land the beetle laughed but emilet was alarmed you haven't snuffed him out have you no danger of it he's only shamming off then said emilet they rolled away at top speed the bandit's lair had been well chosen by their chiefs it was a vast cellar with a vaulted roof and earthen walls bedewed with an icy humidity axes mattocks shovels rakes and watering cans lay scattered on the ground these were worn out tools they had not served their purpose for many a day the lantern a kind of cresset protected by a wire globe was suspended from the roof by a string 
it shed a faint and wavering light creating weird shadows in that far-stretching space too vast for the insufficient illumination directly beneath the cresset lantern inside the circle of light it threw upon the ground a fantastic group of human creatures pressed close to one another drinking shouting chattering singing a clean-shaven man whose suspicious little eyes were perpetually blinking turned to a young woman look here ernestine my beauty are you certain the beetle understood that we should be waiting for him here big ernestine who was crouching on the ground and warming her hands at a wood fire throwing up clouds of smoke shrugged her shoulders stop it do you say things over and over again like a clock nebet since i've told you yes yes it is there now and be hanged to you you don't by chance fancy the beetle has been made a mouthful of do you roars of laughter greeted this nibet was not one of the inner circle he was not much of a favorite in the band of numbers it is true that they reckoned him a comrade useful faithful that they felt safe with him but they bore him a grudge because of his regular employment because of his position because he was an official and first and last his warder's uniform impressed the jailbirds unpleasantly but nibet was not the man to allow himself to be intimidated all the same said he i ask where the three of them have got to if they know the mushroom bed they should have been back long ago he shouted to an old woman eh hey, toulouse tell us the time but mother toulouse shook her head i haven't a watch there was a murmur of protestation the seven or eight hooligans assembled there awaiting the return of the beard and the beetle sent with emilette to kidnap jules could not believe that mother toulouse had told the truth the sailor caught the old woman by the shoulders and shook her and went on shaking her liar aren't you ashamed to be in a funk with us ever since this blessed mother toulouse has sold winkles and many other things ever since she began to make a little purse for herself which must be a big purse by now a purse every one has sweated to fill to the brim she has always distrusted us you say you haven't a watch i tell you you've got dozens of them big ernestine interrupted it's a half hour over the hour agreed a shudder ran through the assembly nibet finger on lip made a sign that they were to listen then in the mushroom bed no longer in use which the band of numbers had recently adopted as their meeting place a profound silence fell there they are said nibet big ernestine leaped up left the fire advanced to the far end of the cellar and imitated the cry of a screech owl to perfection there was a similar cry in response it's all right they're here she said she returned to the fire and sat down but nibet seized the girl and forced her to get up again go along with you quick march he said roughly she protested nibet stopped her oh we can't stand listening to you ho there sailor come here sit down on this plank you the beetle and me we're to be the judges beard makes the accusation and if her heart tells her to ernestine will defend him i'd rather spit at the tell-tale you can tear him to bits as far as i'm concerned cried the girl there's nothing disgusts me so much as a tell-tale the hooligans crowded round big ernestine they applauded her ironically for they all knew that once upon a time she had been strongly suspected of having dealings with what they called the dirty lot at the bobby's nest silence fell once more they could hear the rasp of the rope unrolling from a hand windlass attached to an enormous bucket this was the primitive lift moments passed the hooligans had formed a circle beneath the black hole where the bucket moved up and down it goes old beard questioned nibet gazing upwards it goes bloke brought the game that's what we're sending down now that's a bit of all right sailor now seized the trust jewels from the bucket and flung him on the ground damaged goods that eh he laughed evilly the beetle beard and amelette were coming down in turn the group below bent curiously over the prisoner he's soft that sort is cried ernestine and tapping him on the face with her foot big ernestine tried to make jules show signs of life beard dropped out of the bucket and stopped the game let's see ernestine stop it now after gripping the hand of each comrade in turn after hugging a bottle and draining it in a long draught emptying it to the dregs beard flung it aside let's get to work no time to waste if we finish him off we'll have to get rid of him before morning sailor lifted jules with the aid of two comrades 
they propped him against a massive pillar of wood which supported the cellar roof they bound their wretched victim to it with strong cords meanwhile ernestine was unwinding the gag take your places on the tribunal commanded nibet and you others a glass of pick-me-up for the fellow the pick-me-up intended to restore jules to consciousness was brought by mother toulouche under the form of a large earthen pot full of cold water she dashed the water in the prisoner's face jules slowly opened his eyes and regained his wits amidst an ominous silence the band watched his return to life with evil smiles they quietly watched his pallid face turn a livid green with terror the wretched creature could not utter a syllable he stared wildly at those about him his friends of yesterday at those seated on the mock judgment bench who crouching forward were observing him with sardonic smiles nibet put a question you hear and understand us jules pity howled the victim nibet was indifferent to the cry he understands for my part i am all for keeping to a proper procedure i would not have agreed to sit in judgment on him if he had been unable to defend himself we don't act that way down here turning to his acolytes for signs of their approval he continued beard the word is with you let us hear why he has been brought up to judgment tell us what he is accused of bring up all there is against him beard who was marching up and down between the hooligan tribunal and the accused who was half dead and incapable of making a rational statement stopped squared himself with an air of satisfaction and began his speech for the prosecution jules has anyone ever done you any harm here has anyone played cowardly tricks on you set traps to catch you in have you ever been cheated out of your fair share of the spoil is there anything you can bring up against us no well here's what we have against you it's not worth while lying about it either you are the one who has taken the wind out of our sails over the danidoff affair do you confess that in a voice barely intelligible jules gasped out beard i don't understand you i've done nothing nothing what have you against me beard took his time planted before the prisoner with hip stuck out and hand in pocket the other hand raised in tragic invocation towards his comrades have you heard monsieur does not understand he has not the pluck to be open and above board turning again to the wretched captive he continued well i'm going to explain it was you wasn't it who had to put through the robbery of the lady's jewels well do you know what you did do you want me to tell you instead of lending us a hand as was promised and sworn you kept the cake for yourself in other words you and some of your sort serving at the ball put your heads together and shut up the lady in the room they found her in and that way you got out of sharing with us so we have been done in the eye over that deal the proof that you have comrades we know nothing about is that yesterday when you were done in they found a way to get you out of the salad basket it wasn't us but to return to the danidoff robbery oh you must have laughed then but every one has his turn you are going to laugh on the wrong side of your mouth now do you know what they call it what you've done dared to do in the same strangled voice jules managed to get out the words but it's not true i swear to you beard did not listen there's not one of our lot who would give me the lie to behave like that is treachery you have betrayed the numbers there it is in a nutshell what have you to reply to that for the third time jules repeated in a hoarse whisper for he felt life was gradually leaving him an awful fear gripped him he saw he was completely done for i swear i did not do that i did rob the princess i don't even know who did jules was perhaps speaking the truth but he took the worst way to defend himself if he had had pluck and wit enough to take the beard's accusation with a high hand if he had met threats with violent denial and assertion it is quite possible he might have made an impression in his favour but he cried for pity and for mercy for men who were pitiless he was afraid his fear was shown by the convulsive trembling which agitated his wretched body by his ghastly pallor by the cold drops of sweat rolling down his forehead he was no longer a man it was a lamentable bit of human wreckage the hooligans had before them and the more lamentable this wreck showed itself to be the less worthy of their interest it seemed when jules gasped out once again i swear to you it was not i no i did not do it 
the hooligans moved by a common impulse rose indignant furious mad with rage that's a good one that is yelled nibet who beside himself with rage suddenly forgot his avowed respect for judicial forms since he is determined to tell lies and hasn't the pluck to say what he's done there's only one thing for us to do and that is to stop his mouth up ernestine put the plug back and as the girl once more rolled the scarf round and round the head of the miserable jules nibet turned to his comrades now then one hasn't any need to waste more time over it we know all the story not so it's settled i tell you a fellow who has done what he has done what does he deserve you answer first mother Toulouse, since you are the oldest mother Toulouse stretched out a trembling hand as though calling on heaven to witness an oath i said the old woman with a wicked gleam in her eyes i don't hesitate comrades who flinch sneaks who betray get rid of them say i i condemn him to death the old woman's sentence was greeted with loud applause nibet resumed it is said it is unanimous make a quick finish my lads since each has been injured let him each take his revenge i say death by the hammer in that smoke thickened air rose a chorus of hate and vengeance death by the hammer death by the hammer in that noisome lair of the bandits a horrible scene ensued mother Toulouse went groping in a dark corner she searched for and found a blacksmith's hammer she lifted it with trembling hands and planting herself in front of the victim more dead than alive she said in a menacing voice you did harm to the numbers you wronged them here goes for that then the hammer described a quarter of a circle in the air and descended in a smashing blow on the wretched victim's face the awful punishment had begun according to age one after another the hooligans passed on the hammer and in a blind passion of hate beat following beat on the agonizing body of jules at last the terrible agony was over and done the passion of hate the lust for revenge had burnt themselves out jules had expiated the crime they had imputed to him the band were the victims of a paralyzing fatigue emilette flung the blood-stained hammer into a far corner of their den well done said he he has paid the price emilette's eyes fell on nibet he was leaning against the wall and with folded arms was watching the scene in which he had taken no part walking up to the warder emilette demanded ho ho you backed out of it did you my boy you didn't have a throw did you no nibet grinned sardonically don't talk rubbish emilette if i have stood aside i had my reasons for doing so we haven't done with jules yet not by a long chalk now that he's been killed he's got to be got rid of isn't that true look at yourselves my lambs you're covered with red it will take you all of an hour to make yourselves presentable now look at me i'm neat and clean and i have a plan a famous plan to rid us of that corpse there now just you stir your stumps emilet i am going off to make preparations i'll give you ten minutes to make yourself fit to be seen it's we too who are to be the undertakers and i swear to you that we will give them no end of trouble to the curiosity mongers at police headquarters end of chapter twenty two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com Section 23 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 23. From Val Gerard to Montmartre. On the Boulevard des Palais, Jérôme Fondor looked at his watch. It was half an hour after noon. The hour for copy. Courage. I will go to La Capitale scarcely had he put foot in the large hall when the editorial secretary called there you are fondor at last that's a good thing whatever have you been up to since yesterday evening i got them to telephone to you twice but they could not get on to you try as they might my dear fellow you really mustn't absent yourself without giving us warning fondor looked jovial certainly not repentant oh say at once that i've been in the country but seriously what did you want me for is there anything new a most mysterious scandal another yes you know tomery the sugar refiner yes i know him well he has disappeared no one knows where he is fondor took the news stolidly 
you don't astonish me you must be prepared for anything from those sort of people it was the turn of the secretary to be surprised at fondor's calmness but old man i'm telling you of a disappearance which is causing any amount of talk in paris you don't seem to grasp the situation surely you know that thomery represents one of the biggest fortunes known i know he is worth a lot his flight will bring ruin to many others will probably be enriched by it probably that's not our concern what we are after are details about his disappearance you are free to-day are you not will you take the affair in hand then i would put off the appearance of the paper for half an hour rather than not have details to report which would throw some light on this extraordinary affair then as fondor did not show the slightest intention of going in search of material for a tomary article the secretary laughed why don't you start on the trail fondor my word i don't recognize a fondor who is not off like a zigzag of lightning on such a reporting job as this we want illuminating details my dear man you think i haven't got any then be easy this evening's issue of la capitale will have all the details you could desire on the vanishing of thomery thereupon fondor turned on his heel without further explanation and went towards one of his colleagues who went by the title of financier of the paper the financier had an official manner and had an office of his own the walls of which were carefully padded for marville that was his name frequently received visits from important personages fondor began questioning him on the subject of thomery's disappearance tell me my dear fellow what is happening in the financial world now that thomery has disappeared what do you mean where is the money going all the coppers the coppers why yes i fancy that when an old fellow like that does the vanishing trick there are terrible results on the bourse will you be kind enough to explain what does happen in such a case very much flattered by fondor's request marville cried but my boy you are asking for nothing less than a course of political economy but i cannot do that on the spur of the moment state precisely what you want to know what i want to know is just this who loses money through thomery's disappearance the financier raised his hands to heaven but everybody everybody thomery was a daring fellow without him his business is nothing there was a big failure on the market to-day good but who gains by it how who gains by it yes i presume thomery's disappearance must be profitable to someone can you think of any people to whose interest it would be that this old fellow should disappear the financier reflected those who gain by money by the disappearance of thomery only the speculators i should say suppose now that a monsieur tartempion had bought thomery shares at ninety francs to-day those shares would not be worth more than seventy francs tartempion loses money but let us suppose some financier speculates on the probable fall of thomery shares and has sold to clients speculating on the rise of these shares these shares to be delivered in a fortnight at a price of ninety francs if thomery was still there his shares would be worth possibly the ninety francs possibly more in the first case the financier's deal would amount to nothing in the second case his deal would be a deplorable one because he would be obliged to deliver at an inferior price and would be responsible for the difference whilst thomery dead dead no but simply in flight his shares fall to nothing and this same financier may buy at sixty francs which he must deliver at ninety francs in fifteen days in that case he has done excellent business excellent certainly and tell me my dear marville do you know if there has been any such deal in thomery shares on a large scale ah oh, you ask me more than i can tell you now but that would be known at the bourse no doubt jerome fondor was going to continue his interrogation but there was a great disturbance in the editorial room near by they were shouting fondor fondor the editorial secretary entered the financier's room and catching sight of fondor he cried what's the meaning of this what are you up to here i told you this thomery affair was important be off for the news as quick as you can here is the havas it seems they have just found thomery's body in a little apartment in the rue le corbe fondor forced himself to appear very interested already the police have been quick 
I also had an idea that that Tomery had more than simply disappeared. "'You had that idea?' asked the startled secretary. "'Yes, my dear fellow, I had, absolutely.' After a silence, Fondor added, "'All the same, I am going out to get news. In half an hour's time I will telephone details of the death. Does the Havas say whether it is a crime or a suicide?' "'No, evidently the police know nothing.' monsieur havard i am delighted to meet you surely now you will not refuse to give me a little interview not i my dear fondor i know only too well that you would not take no for an answer and you are right i beg of you to give me some details not as regards tomery's death for i have already made my little investigation touching that but as to how the police managed to find the poor man's body in the easiest way in the world monsieur tomery's servants were very much astonished yesterday morning when they could not find their master at the house after eleven tomery's absence from the bourse gave rise to disquieting rumours he had some big deals to put through therefore his absence could only be accounted for in one way he had had an accident of some sort naturally enough they warned headquarters and at once i suspected there might be a little scandal of some sort you guess that i immediately went myself to tomery's house i examined his papers and i found by chance three receipts for the rent of a flat in the name of monsieur durand rue de Corbe. one of them was of recent date i of course sent one of my men to ascertain who lived there this man learned from the portress that there was a new tenant there who had not yet moved in with his furniture but who the evening before had brought in a heavy trunk my man went up to his flat and had the door opened you know under what conditions he found tomery's dead body and you did not find indications which went to show why monsieur tomery committed suicide committed suicide when a financier disappears my fondor one is always tempted to cry suicide but this time i confess to you that i do not think it was anything of the kind because because and monsieur havard bent his head well when i reached the scene of the crime i immediately thought that we were not face to face with a suicide a man who wishes to kill himself and to kill himself because of money affairs a man like tomery does not feel the necessity of committing suicide in a little flat rented under a false name and in front of a trunk which you know do you not belonged to mademoiselle delon one might swear that everything was arranged expressly to make anyone believe that tomery had strangled himself after having stolen the trunk for some unknown reason you did not find any kind of clue yes indeed and you know it as well as i do for i have no doubt the extraordinary event has been the gossip of the neighbourhood on the cover of the trunk we have once again found an imprint a very clear impression the famous imprint of jacques delon and you found nothing else yes in the dust on the floor we found the marks of steps numerous footmarks we have made tracings of them my steps evidently thought fondor but what he said was what in short is your view of the general position monsieur havard i am very much bothered about it for my part i think we are once again faced by another of jacques delon's crimes this wretch after having attempted to assassinate his sister has learned that we were going to search the mademoiselle's room he then made arrangements to steal this trunk by pretending to be a police inspector as you know then he brought the trunk to his flat examined its contents thoroughly and having some special interest in the sugar refiner's death he managed to get him to come to the flat and there assassinated him leaving his dead body in front of this trunk where it was bound to be seen all this he did in order to tangle the traces and perplex those on his track but how do you explain the fact of jacques Delon being so simple as to leave the imprints of his hand everywhere deuce take it this individual is at liberty he reads the papers he knows that monsieur bertillon is tracing him so great a criminal would certainly be on his guard of course such a successful criminal as delon has shown himself to be must have resources at his disposal which allow him to laugh at the police he does not trouble to cover his tracks it is enough for him that he should escape us as fondor could not suppress a smile the chief of the detective force added oh we shall finish by arresting delon have no fear so far he has quite extraordinary luck in his favour but the luck will turn and we shall put our hand on his collar i certainly hope you may but what are you going to do now 
the two had stopped on the edge of the pavement and were talking without paying any attention to the passers-by who rubbed shoulders with them the well-known journalist and the important police official were unrecognized monsieur havard took fandor's arm look here come along with me fandor just the time to telephone to a police station and then i will take you with me to make a fresh investigation where at jacques delon's studio i have kept the key of the house and i wish to see whether i can find any other rent receipts made out in the name of durand though i can see how delon inveigled delon into a trap i do not understand how it came about that thomery paid the rent of that trap there is some subtle contrivance of delon's here i want to get to the bottom of it will you come to the rue norvans i jolly well will cried fondor the chief of the detective force telephoned to headquarters whilst fondor got into communication with la capitale he sent on a report of the thomery case up to that moment quitting the police station the two men hailed a cab and were driven to the rue norvans as far as they could tell the artist's house had not been entered since elizabeth delon's departure the neglected garden with its rank growth of grass and weeds gave an added air of melancholy to the deserted house monsieur havard put the key in the lock of the front door don't you think fondor it gives one a queer feeling to enter a house where an unaccountable crime has been committed the key grated in the lock and monsieur havard added in spite of oneself there is the feeling that some terrifying spectre is lurking within or a ghost said fondor as the door was unlocked and opened our journalist asked where shall we start this domiciliary visit let us begin with the studio replied monsieur havard mounting to the first story no sooner had they entered the room than a double cry escaped from the two men oh great heaven in the middle of the studio there was the rigid body of a man hanging they rushed forward dead was monsieur havard's cry horribly dead echoed fandor shall we never lay hands on those wretches monsieur havard stared horrified at the hanging corpse he brought a chair grasped the strong sharp knife he always carried about him and aided by fandor he cut the rope laid the hanged man flat on the floor and proceeded to examine the miserable remnant of a human being the face was swollen gashed crushed the hands have been dipped in vitriol they did not want fingerprints taken it is it is jacques delon fondor shook his head jacques delon of course it isn't if it were delon he would not hang himself here why should he hang himself monsieur havard remarked he has not hanged himself again the stage has been set i could swear the man had been killed by blows from a hammer and hanged afterwards it seems to me that if death had been caused through strangulation there would have been marks round the neck but see fondor the rope has hardly made a mark no the man was dead when they strung him up it is of secondary importance remarked fondor who was preoccupied you are mistaken it matters a great deal it decidedly looks as if delon had accomplices who wished to be rid of him fondor shook his head it is not delon it cannot be delon look at the vitriolized hands that was a precaution i say as you did just now it's like a set-piece a bit of slag assassin's stagecraft i say in delon's house we have found delon at home fondor was not convinced he felt certain delon had lied in the depot well elizabeth delon can settle the question for us there may be some physical peculiarity some mark by which she can identify her brother's body but fondor was examining the body very carefully suddenly he rose from his stooping posture exclaiming i know who it is who oh. jules none other than madame borat's servant jules that is to say an accomplice whom the bandits we are after wanted to be rid of he might have given them away when brought up for examination that was why they managed his escape they killed him afterwards because he had served their turn and was now an encumbrance your explanation is plausible fondor but how about the truth of it this proves the truth of it cried fondor pointing to a cicatrice on the back of the neck of the murdered man it was the clear mark of where an abscess had been i am certain i noticed a similar mark on the neck of jules he sat in front of me the other day and i particularly noticed this mark the dead man is jules i am certain it is jules monsieur havard was silent presently he said 
if it is jules it must be admitted that we are no farther forward fandor was about to utter a protest when there was a knock on the studio door startled the two men looked at each other anxiously it can only be one of the force murmured monsieur havard i told them i was coming here with you and that they were to send for me if necessary the two men walked to the door monsieur havard opened it there stood a cyclist member of the police force he saluted respectfully and told his chief that he had come with a message from michel the message that the arrest is successful chief which that of the band of numbers chief good whom have you bagged almost the whole lot chief that is to say mother Toulouse, beard mimile otherwise emilet and the cooper and a few more whose names are not known fondor said laughing not cranajour i am certain no cranajour has escaped answered the policeman turning to monsieur havard he asked have you no instructions chief no tell me how did the capture go perfectly chief they were assembled in mother Toulouse's store they went like lambs good good monsieur havard gave the policeman some orders the cyclist leaped into the saddle and disappeared how did you guess that cranajour was still at liberty asked monsieur havard fandor smiled good business you take me to be more stupid than i am it is cranajour's information which has enabled you to arrest the band of numbers consequently cranajour's information you are mad fandor whatever makes you imagine that cranajour belongs to our force fandor looked monsieur havard straight in the eye and said coolly juva has never told me that he had sent in his resignation monsieur havard looked searchingly at our journalist before remarking come now what is this you are telling me poor juva fandor wished to save the chief of the detective department from telling useless falsehoods monsieur havard monsieur havard interrogate the members of the band of numbers and don't trouble about how i got my information but be sure of one thing there are dead men of whom i can tell tales of whose existence i am as well aware as you yourself as the chief stared at the journalist looking more and more astonished fandor added and i do not refer to delon i am referring to juva to my dear friend juva the king of detectives end of chapter twenty three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 24 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 24 At Saint Lazare. Hop along there. See if you can't hurry up a bit. The warder opened the door of Elizabeth Delon's cell and pushed in an old woman, a horrid-looking creature. "'In with you,' commanded the warder in a harsh tone. "'You are to stay here till tomorrow. We will find another place for you when we get instructions.' Poor Elizabeth Delon stared miserably at this strange companion which fate, in the person of a warder, had thrust on her. The old woman stared with no little curiosity at the pale, sad girl silence fell for a few minutes then the new prisoner asked in a tone of rough familiarity what's your name i call myself elizabeth don't know it elizabeth who elizabeth Delon. the old woman rose from the corner of the mattress she had seated herself on true you're elizabeth Delon. well that's funny have you been nabbed long you ask if it is long since i was nabbed taken arrested eh elizabeth nodded in the affirmative it seemed to her that an infinity of time had passed since her imprisonment at saint lazare i was nabbed last night if you want to know my name i'm called mother Toulouse. they say i'm one of the band of numbers and that i receive stolen goods lies that's well understood elizabeth had no desire to go into such an unsavoury question this horrid old woman rather frightened her but such had been her distress and fears since she had been a prisoner that it was a relief not to be quite alone to have even this old creature to speak to was better than solitary confinement in her character of old jailbird mother Toulouse made herself quickly at home 
Move tomorrow, they say I'm to be. Pity. At bottom, you're not one of the scurvy sort, but you must be here to play spy on me for all that. When do you go out? Are you long for San Lago? Alas, how could Elizabeth tell? I like being a barrister, thought Fondor as he entered San Lazar. For the last hour I have felt a different person, much more serious, more sure of myself, not to say more eloquent. I must be eloquent, since I have succeeded in persuading my friend, Maitre Dubard, to get himself appointed officially as Mademoiselle de Lannes' counsel, then to obtain a permit of communication, and to hand this same permit over to me, so that his identification papers, safely tucked away in my portfolio, make of me the most indisputable of Maitre's Dubard. Fondor might well congratulate himself by means of this ruse his own idea he was enabled to see elizabeth not in the prison parlour but in a special cell and without a witness as fondor crossed the threshold of the sordid building he said to himself i am maitre de bard visiting his client in order to prepare her defence he easily accomplished the necessary formalities and at last he saw himself being conducted by a morose warder to a little parlour scantily furnished with a table and a few stools please be seated maitre said the surly fellow i'll fetch your client along fondor put down his portfolio but remained standing anxious all a quiver at the thought that he was about to see his dear elizabeth appear between two warders just like a common prisoner in a moment she will be here thought he but she must on no account recognize him on entering by an exclamation she might betray his identity and complicate things therefore fondor feigned to be absorbed in a newspaper he unfolded and raised so as to hide his face from the approaching pair the door opened come now go in growled the warder maitre when you wish to leave you have only to ring the door fell too heavily behind the warder fondor made a sharp movement he stood revealed he hurried up to elizabeth oh tell me how you are mademoiselle elizabeth he cried but the girl was struck dumb she grew suddenly pale and made no reply elizabeth elizabeth will you not give me your hand even you do not understand why i am here i had to see you speak to you without a witness that's why i have passed myself off as an advocate the startled girl was regaining her self-control fondor was gazing at her with frankly admiring eyes poor elizabeth how i have made you suffer the poor girl's eyes filled with tears why have you betrayed me she demanded in a voice trembling with restrained emotion oh how could you get me arrested you who well know i am not guilty you really believe i have betrayed you you actually credited me with that these two young people meeting in a prison parlour under such tragic circumstances were hurt and even angry with each other elizabeth delon went on why did you not tell me that you had found on that piece of soap traces of my brother's finger marks why did you accuse me of having received a visit from him when you yourself had proved that he was dead fondor took elizabeth's two little hands in his and pressed them long and tenderly my dear elizabeth when i engineered this theatrical stroke in the presence of the examining magistrate in order to secure your arrest believe me i had no time to warn you of what i meant to do ah oh, if i could have warned you but it would have only disturbed you to no good purpose besides your being really taken by surprise was a help there could not be any idea of collusion of course you want the answer to this riddle you shall have it that is why i am here don't you remember elizabeth that on the evening before the fatal day you told me that i had twice rung you up on the telephone and that each time you answered the call you could not find me at the end of the line you cannot imagine what i felt when i heard you say that i never telephoned i never telephoned to the convent the obvious conclusion was that the individuals who for some reason did not wish to make themselves known did wish to keep track of you and to assure themselves that you were still at the convent rue de la glaciere fondor's voice trembled a little as he went on and i was at once afraid my poor child that these people who were pursuing you might be the very same who had got into madame burat's house and had tried to kill you ah uh, do you not see how greatly it hurt and troubled me to think that i had taken you to the convent and had there placed you in security as i thought but where you were far from being safe again fondor took elizabeth's hands in his 
you do understand now dear child why i had you arrested i felt you would be safe here you see i could not get your persecutors imprisoned and so prevent them from getting at you to imprison you was the alternative you are better guarded here than elsewhere elizabeth smiled a little smile when she saw how moved fondor was but replied she there is the other point you certainly told me that you were sure my brother was killed in prison in his cell certainly i did the assassination of your brother was premeditated if the criminals have had accomplices at the depot and such there certainly were they have been bought over little by little the fact of your brother's murder is fresh in the memory of the police of all therefore a special watch is kept over you i ascertained that it would be so and fuselier himself assured me of it there is a warder specially told off to keep a close guard over you a safe man known to be beyond suspicion no elizabeth do believe me if i was the cause of your horrified surprise the other day and then of your imprisonment i wished to be sure that you were as safe as it was possible to be then freed from such intense anxiety i felt i should be at liberty to continue my investigations do say you forgive me all elizabeth could say was but why not have warned me i still can't see why because i only thought of the plan at the last moment also because i feared you might not be able to act surprised naturally enough it was absolutely yes absolutely necessary that everyone should take your arrest seriously surely elizabeth you can understand that he repeated his plea do do say you forgive me elizabeth the smile returned to elizabeth's lips she was much moved indeed i do you are always my very good friend you think of everything and you watch over me as if intimidated blushing hotly she stopped short then changed the conversation do tell me if you have heard anything fresh fondor returned to his normal self also he had sworn to himself that he would not tell elizabeth he loved her until he had succeeded in unravelling the tangled skein of the terrible delon affair i shall speak thought he when she is once more at peace and free when she is out of danger i do not want her to consent to love me just because i have devoted myself to her brother's case elizabeth shall be my wife please god but only if i deserve her if i can win her and jerome fondor told her the story of the famous wicker trunk but he did not mention Tomery's death, nor did he speak of the horrible murder of Jules. What was the use of saddening Elizabeth, of adding needlessly to her terrors? Instead, he thought it better to learn what he could from her. "'I have not found that famous list,' said he. "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' cried Elizabeth. "'I was so worried. Just imagine that. I found the list after all, and I thought I had lost it. It was in one of my little handbags. I had put it there to bring to you. Here it is.' they were quite willing to let me keep it fondor eagerly took the paper from elizabeth and proceeded to examine it yes it certainly was a page torn from a notebook of medium size an unknown hand had traced the following words in bold writing the names succeeded one another in the form of a list baroness de vibray april three jacques delon dep idem sonia danidoff april twelfth barbey nantoul may fifteen gerine madame b Tomery during may barbey nantoul end may fondor could not find anything more on the paper whilst elizabeth sat silent fondor reflected baroness de vibray april three jacques delan these correspond exactly with the commencement of this mysterious affair the two first deaths and the date of their death what does dep signify the initials of a name or yes dep depot idem yes depot the same day that's it sonia danidoff april twelve the full name the exact date barbe nantoul may fifteen the affair of rue de quatre septembre occurred may twenty that's pretty near two more names and one date which exactly tallies gerine madame b who are they why no date ah gerine lawyer of madame de vibray a crime planned without date perhaps because he was not indispensable and tomery tomery who died in the middle of may as this plan indicates but how about the last line barbe nantoul end of may oh beyond a doubt the bankers were to be victims of some fresh aggression on the part of the mysterious author of these lines 
barbey nantoul end of may we are at the twenty-eighth of the month only three more days before the sinister date falls due are they to be attacked or is it their money how to defend them how to organize a trap for the mice suddenly fondor looked up saw elizabeth's anxiety and said quietly well this list agrees in every particular with the description you gave me of it and i don't see what fresh information we are likely to get from it however will you leave it with me fondor rose ah there is one point which has just occurred to me fondor's voice trembled a good deal do you know for a fact that your brother had bought thomery shares he had very few three or four i think the barbe nantou got them for him and your brother had to pay for them by a certain date yes fondor now felt he must tear himself away he was deeply moved elizabeth elizabeth he cried i swear to you we shall clear up these dreadful mysteries amidst which we live and more you and i only have confidence i implore you grant me a week's grace less even fondor pressed elizabeth's hands as though he could never let them go such little hands and so dear it was not a farewell he took it was a veritable flight he took from the girl who now meant so much to him leaving the prison fondor walked straight ahead thinking aloud it is clear evident the barbe nantouls have sold thomery shares to be paid up on a certain date thomery was murdered so that his shares should fall to zero and so that barbe nantouls should realize enormous sums at their monthly clearance next saturday the coffers of the barbe nantoul bank will be full of gold and this same saturday is the last day of may the fatal day inscribed on the list yes this coming saturday they will pillage the barbe nantoul bank end of chapter twenty four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 25 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 25 A Mouse Trap. Jerome Fondor had been ringing Juve's doorbell in vain. The great detective was not at home. What the deuce is he doing? What has become of him? never have i needed his advice as i need it now his support encouragement what a comfort they would be it is impossible he would have dissuaded me against the attempt or he might have joined forces with me hang it all it was a jolly bad move on juve's part to make himself scarce at such a critical moment for me it is a long time too since i had news of him were i not certain that he has sound reasons for his absence juve never acts haphazard i should be desperately anxious fondor consulted his watch four o'clock he had time then he could think over all the dramatic events in which he had been involved during the past weeks beginning with the rue norvans affair and ending how and when at last our journalist arrived before the immense building which forms the corner of the rue de cliche he saw in front of him the tall windows of the flat occupied by nantoul on the ground floor were the bank offices well thought fondor i certainly am going to do an unconventional thing if my summing up of them is right these bankers are balanced calm cold without imagination and distrusting it in others i shall have to be eloquent to convince them to make them listen to me and get them to do what i want will they show me the door as though i were an intriguer or a madman i shall not let them do it ah they will owe me a fine candle if i have the good luck whether there will be good luck for my venture and gratitude from the bankers remains to be seen here goes seated behind their large and important-looking writing-table as though judges behind a judgment seat monsieurs barbet and nantoul in their immense reception office separated from the rest of the world by a number of padded doors had just said to fondor who was standing in front of them we are listening to you monsieur fondor had asked to see the bankers and to see them only stating that he would wait if they were engaged he had been shown into a handsomely furnished room then into another then into a third finally he had been ushered into the office of the partners 
he had waited there for a few minutes alone he recognized it as the same room in which he had interviewed monsieur barbey a few weeks earlier again he saw the same hangings the same fine rugs the same velvet armchair of classic design then barbey solemn and nantoul elegant a rose in his buttonhole had entered the room their manner stiff starched showing no surprise accustomed as they were to receive visitors of all sorts and all kinds they were polite but not cordial fondor accustomed to society as he was and audacious as he had to be in the exercise of his profession was intimidated for a moment by the calm simplicity of the two men these strictly conventional bankers to whom he was about to say such strange things and make a most unexpected proposition first of all he made excuse on excuse for having disturbed the bankers at their post time then anxiety overcame every consideration of conventional propriety full of persuasive ardour he went straight to the point monsieurs declared he you are more deeply involved than you might think in the mysterious affairs occupying the attention of the police at this moment so far they have not got to the bottom of them i myself through the necessities of my profession and owing to other circumstances have been drawn into an investigation conjointly with the detective department an investigation which has had definite results it has enabled me to discover clues of the highest importance i learned too late alas to prevent the tragedies that certain persons were the chosen victims of these mysterious criminals madame de vibray the princess danidoff were condemned beforehand the robbery of your gold was carefully arranged now to my point monsieurs you yourselves are sentenced the execution of the sentence to be carried out three days hence do you believe me fondor had drawn nearer the two bankers only the immense mahogany writing-table stood between them the partners had listened with cold attention nevertheless a slight trembling of monsieur barbey's lips betrayed hidden feeling noticing this fondor was emboldened to proceed monsieur nantoul in a slightly sneering tone but with a perfectly correct manner replied to the ardent young journalist we are greatly obliged to you monsieur for the sympathy you have shown us by coming to give us information regarding the mysterious assassins whom the police are so zealously trying to round up believe me we are accustomed to take our precautions seeing that we have the handling of enormous sums of money we are none the less grateful to you for your interest in us and for your warning it is not a question of gratitude interrupted fandor sharply we have to deal with very strong opponents i say we because i have become more and more personally involved in all these crime tragedies believe me i speak from five years experience as a reporter who has had to report on an average one crime a day up to now nothing absolutely nothing has hindered the criminals from executing their plans but warned in time we may be able to thwart them but interrupted monsieur barbey who had grown more and more serious what are you aiming at fandor felt that the decisive moment had arrived bending across the table his face almost touching the faces of the two men he said slowly and distinctly monsieurs i have asked la capitale to grant me three days leave i have brought a little travelling bag with me here it is leaving home as i did about half an hour ago i consider i have arrived at the end of my journey will you offer me hospitality for the next forty-eight hours i know that you monsieur nantoul live above your offices whilst monsieur barbey goes home every evening to his place at st germain i ask you to give up your room to me for i am determined not to leave here for an instant fandor in his eagerness had spoken faster and faster and his heart was beating violently he stared fixedly at the two men he quite expected that his demand would excite astonishment that objections would be raised and he was ready with a crowd of arguments by which to convince them and carry his point but the surprise was his for the bankers did not seem particularly astonished they consulted each other with a look then as barbey opened his mouth to reply nantoul began to speak rising politely at the same time monsieur fandor your last statements and remarks are too serious to be passed over lightly your offer is too generous to be rejected without consideration will you allow us to retire for a minute or two my partner and i will discuss the question for about ten minutes fandor marched up and down the sumptuous room then one of the padded doors opened silently and barbey entered more solemn than ever nantoul was smiling monsieur said barbey in weighty tones 
my partner and i in view of the exceptional seriousness of the situation for your words carry conviction have come to a decision we beg of you to consider yourself our guest from this moment and to consider this house as your own and it is understood of course that you will dine with us this evening added nanteuil with friendly graciousness monsieur barbey will be of the party and will pass the night in our company and you can count on it that we shall drink a good bottle of burgundy to enable us to await with patience and serenity the audacious individuals you say we are to expect dear monsieur fandor here are some illustrated papers with some gay sketches of dear little women to exercise your patience over whilst we sign our outgoing letters as fast as possible end of chapter twenty five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 26 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 26 In the Trap the servant had retired leaving the three men to their fruit and wine his hosts turned to fandor in mute interrogation but fandor continued to peel a superb peach with the utmost coolness he did not seem disposed to talk barbey broke the silence tell me now that your first day on guard is ended and you have not left us for a moment have you noticed anything at all suspicious fandor shook his head nothing whatever this was not strictly true for he had noticed an individual in the bank occupied in repairing the telephone he had made discreet inquiries and had been told that he was a workman sent by the state at the request of the bankers to see that the lines were in good working order this explanation had at first set his mind at rest regarding the comings and goings of this individual but just when he was going in to dinner at seven o'clock fandor had come across the man in the vestibule of the bank making preparations to depart it had been a painful surprise for fandor he recognized the man but could not remember exactly who he was or where he had seen him was this workman one of the mysterious band of criminals who he was more and more convinced meant to strike a blow at monsieur barbey and his partner nanteuil if fandor had had anything to go upon he would have had the man shadowed but he had no sure ground for his suspicions besides sent by the state the man was most probably what he seemed as he was working for the government he could easily be traced should such a step be found necessary but to make certain that all was as it should be fandor had examined the work done by this individual during the day there was nothing wrong with it beyond a doubt the man was an expert therefore fandor had felt justified in saying that he had noticed nothing suspicious during the day so much the worse remarked monsieur barbey with a shrug probably the individuals who are threatening us have been warned of your presence here and are on their guard i rejoice as far as we are concerned but as regards the general interest i almost regret it that your trap should prove effective is what we must wish have no fear dear monsieur barbey it will not be laid in vain knowing the cunning the cleverness of my adversaries i have not the least doubt they know i am here but i also know that the audacity of these criminals is such that my presence here would not deter them from making their attempt they believe themselves the stronger but i hope to undeceive them what is your plan of campaign to-night asked monsieur nanteuil before replying to that will you show me all the means of access to the house with the greatest pleasure the three men left the dining-room then went into the vestibule our courtyard gate is at the far end of the house on the right said nanteuil on the left there are the bank offices they occupy this ground floor the only entrance to them is through this vestibule this door closed it is impossible to get in not by the windows looking onto the street asked fandor no those windows have heavy iron bars before them to remove them would be difficult very as to the windows looking on to the garden they are closed every evening you can see for yourself by strong wooden shutters fastened on the inside so the bank offices are perfectly protected said fandor 
we believe so now come upstairs to the floor above here is a large corridor and that door on the right opens into a library the two rooms which come next are my own room and a dressing room the other rooms are unoccupied does your room face the street or the garden asked fondor the garden and the windows the windows yes would it be difficult or impossible to climb up to them it would be difficult but not impossible no one ever enters the garden if absolutely necessary a ladder could be placed against them a square of glass could be cut out and the fastening could be undone but come and see the room you can then judge for yourself fondor inspected the room most carefully the banker was right it would be comparatively easy to get into the room by the window but the other entrances to the room could be easily watched they resolved themselves into one door which opened on to the corridor monsieur nanteuil's room was lightly furnished he evidently favored the modern method it was a bare apartment but it was hygienic ah said fandor the bed has its back to the door and faces the window very right you have electric light i see near the fireplace and above your bed then it is possible to switch on a bright light at any time valuable that having finished a minute inspection of the room and to the amusement of the bankers having looked under the bed to make sure that no one had hidden himself beneath it fondor declared i am decidedly pleased with this room and if you see no objection i wish to stay here and wait the visitors of to-night you think of sleeping here alone alone decidedly i do it is pretty certain that these men know every inch of your flat and if they are the sort i take them to be they will make certain that everything here is as usual before attempting to attack the bank i do not wish them to be frightened off by finding a companion at my side and i particularly wish them to mistake me for you but that is frightfully dangerous surely objected nantoul reassure yourself monsieur i do not run any great risk they won't know i am watching them but i shall have this advantage over them i am on the lookout for the rascally assassins and robbers and i do not fear them in the slightest fondor was not going to own that he knew there was danger but he was keenly set on running this particular risk for by so doing might he not discover the truth when the bankers left him for the night fondor again examined every corner of the room and all it contained he tested the electric light switch he took a mental photograph of the situation of the pieces of furniture he got into bed half dressed and lay quietly grasping his revolver fully loaded he switched off the light and in that large room veiled in darkness he awaited the events of the night the noises from the street reached him indistinctly the silence about him was menacing something was going to happen here something sudden unforeseen perhaps irremediable minute by minute time went by interminable monotonous casting a soft veil of sleep over the eyes of fondor but thoughts were rising within him more and more keenly he was realizing the horrible danger he was exposing himself to beneath closed eyes his brain was active his imagination afire elizabeth delan must be avenged was his persistent thought consequently i must run some risks to achieve that a definite fear tormented him he thought of the curious sleep elizabeth had fallen victim to in the boarding-house provided i have not taken some narcotic without knowing it suppose the villains are going to inject into the room some gas which would suffocate me and i should not know i was breathing it in suppose i lose consciousness and slip into death but fondor drew himself together he stiffened his will do they know i am in this room waiting to entrap them do they think they will find nantoul here defenceless who was that workman i ought to be able to put a name to that familiar face how slow how deadly slow the tick-tack tick-tack of the timepiece centuries passed between the striking of the hours would it be to-night to-morrow night or on the corridor carpet outside the room a slight rustling sound continuous barely perceptible caught fondor's listening ear who was it was it any one at all was it imagination he listened intently not a sound now but yes the same rustling sound it was nearer moving along the wall 
Fondor closed his eyes an instant, so vividly did he feel that someone was looking at him through the wall. Seconds beat by, seconds that might culminate in a moment of horror, seconds passing steadily by in regular succession, sinking into nothingness. Had someone moved? Were there steps by the door? Fondor thought he heard strange sounds all around him, in the room itself. His nerves were tensely strung. He was overwrought. Someone was certainly walking in the corridor. He had felt a movement along the wall against which his bed stood. Impossible to hesitate longer. The doorknob, which he could not see in the darkness, must have moved. Fondor sensed this movement as surely as though he himself had placed his hand on the knob. Yes, the door was going to open. It was ajar. It was turning on its hinges. It was open. Someone was coming in. Who? Fondor lay still. He dared not move an eyelid, but in his mind he said, Come in, then. Take the trouble to come in. Thus Fondor, who believed death was entering the room, dared to welcome the grim visitor with a smile. Nothing was happening. Fondor's feverish excitement sank down to depression. He must have deceived himself. No one was entering the room. Nothing untoward was happening. He had simply imagined the noises outside in the corridor, for nothing happened. Nothing and once more he was following the eternal tick-tack, tick-tack of the timepiece. The head of Fondor's bed was near the door. He could not, in the dense darkness, fix the point where he supposed the enemy would find him, and he had the agonizing conviction that they were very much at their ease, that they knew exactly where he was, and were quietly preparing their attack. But had these unknown assassins entered the room? yes it was certain there were men behind him bending over him with outstretched hands to strangle him he could hear the sound their fingers made in passing through the air to grip his throat to squeeze his life out though he lived a hundred years never could fondor forget the agonizing thrill when he sensed that hidden danger he held his revolver ready to fire he thought in whatever way i am attacked i must not let slip this unique chance to learn the truth I must seize the attacker at all costs and leap to the electric switch, turn on the light, and I shall be saved, saved. Without a cry, without a warning sound, without a moment's time to cope with the violence of the attack, Fondor felt a cloth over his face, strong hands on his throat, a heavy weight crushing his chest. I am lost, flashed through his mind. I meant to find out the truth, his will declared. With all the force of resistant muscle and will, he disengaged himself from the power crushing him to death, seized an arm by chance, hung on to it, gripped it, threw off the man, ran to the switch, shouting, Help! Again Fondor thought he was done for. The switch acted, but no light flashed forth. They had cut the wire. Men were holding on to him. Their grip was tightening. A voice gave a strangled cry. Help! A strange voice? Whose? Fondor was weakening. His right hand seemed to be caught in a vice which would break and crush it. It was growing tighter and tighter. It was wrenching his arm, was dragging him backwards. It would fracture his shoulder blade. Who? Who? By a miraculous effort he freed himself. He leaped away, sprang to the mantelpiece, seized a pocket electric torch he had placed there. Clack! A light flashed out. Fondor saw, recognized his attacker. Ah, the form he had seen before. A slim figure clothed in black ah this murderer whose face was concealed by a hooded mask fondor shouted at him fantomas it is you and i fantomas but already this mysterious bandit unmasked by the unexpected light had rushed on our journalist the electric torch was extinguished the struggle recommenced fierce formidable desperate fondor was seized by the throat in a strangling grip he was choking his right arm so twisted so bruised was powerless and in that hand now so deadened and helpless that it seemed detached from his body was his revolver he must shoot though almost powerless in the formidable grip of the bandit he must shoot if he was to be saved he managed to pull the trigger there was a loud report fondor felt himself flung towards the wall the vice loosed its grip there was a terrific din the window panes were shattered a heavy piece of furniture was pushed aside oscillated fell with a crash then a sudden silence but a silence broken by gaspings, loud breathings, hoarse sounds, an agonizing death-rattle. The dead pause seemed interminable. Fondor was about to shoot again when a voice close to him cried, He is escaping! He is escaping! 
Fondor recognized that voice. Another voice said, We must have a light. A wax match flamed and flared. By its wavering light, Fondor could distinguish three men in the room. Their clothes were torn, there was blood on their faces, they were panting, they stared at one another. Fondor recognized them instantly. Leaning against the bed, a gash in his cheek, was Monsieur Barbie. Lying on the floor, apparently half dead, was Monsieur Nantoul. Calmly lighting a candle was the telephone workman. He alone seemed unmoved. Fondor threw down his revolver and, coolly marching to the door, locked it. Monsieur Barbie followed the journalist with a look. He made a gesture of discouragement and pointed to the window. Its panes were smashed to pieces. "'We are tricked. Done,' he said. "'The assassin has got away.' But Fondor, with a shrug, marched up to the window, returned, and said in a matter-of-fact tone, "'It is impossible that Fantomas could have made his escape that way.' The workman nodded gravely. "'Monsieur Fondor,' said he, "'I am entirely of your opinion.'" End of chapter 26 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 27 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Sylvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 27. The Imprint. Monsieur Fondor, I am entirely of your opinion. Hearing these words, Fondor, who had regained his self-possession and was ready to start fighting again if necessary, looked at the individual who had made this statement the individual whose face was oddly familiar who are you he asked the individual smiled broadly don't you recognize me he asked he removed his wig threw the candlelight on himself and smilingly announced his style and title sergeant juva once of the detective force formerly dead now amateur policeman you you juva cried fandor and to think i suspected you but the two bankers interrupted at one and the same moment what are you doing here juva smiled the art i practised brought me since my interest in the dolan affair is so keen i follow it up i wish to find the secret of it just through love of my art i dabble in it nowadays but juva how did you get here questioned fandor aha if you have made some psychological discoveries if reasoning has landed you here now facts have led me here you know i was shadowing the band of numbers you know that in the skin of cranajour i was intimate with those rascals to my astonishment i found that my wretched companions had dealings with the barbey nantour bank who of course had no suspicion of it are you surprised then that i felt it incumbent on me to visit this bank besides yesterday i saw you enter here but you never came out again you had reasons for acting so i determined to be near you in case you needed my help i therefore passed myself off as a workman come to attend to the telephone installation it was easy enough for i am a good electrician well when i found that you were preparing to pass the night here i laid my plans accordingly i pretended to leave the premises but really i hid myself in the house just now when you called for help i came to your aid as quickly as i could naturally just as we did remarked monsieur barbey looking at his partner monsieur nantoul contented himself with a nod he added alas once again that criminal has escaped fantomas since it was fantomas who was here just now fantomas has got away and nantoul pointed to the broken window by which it would seem the criminal taking advantage of the noise had escaped both fondor and juva shrugged doubtfully you believe then monsieur nantoul that fantomas has left this room questioned our young journalist what the devil do you mean asked nantoul juva demanded which way did he make his escape nantoul pointed why that way by this window where else you can see quite well that he has broken the panes why look his hooded cloak has got caught in the window latch fondor lay back in an armchair he seemed much amused he silenced Juba with a gesture and turned to Nantoul. I can assure, dear Monsieur Nantoul, that Fantobas has not left the room by this window. Because? 
because this window has been broken by means of this chair this chair which he flung against the panes to put us on the wrong scent and make us believe he had escaped that way just look at this chair it is still strewn with broken bits of glass look there is even a little bit stuck into the wood but that proves nothing fantomas has broken the window panes as best he could and then made his escape in that case insisted fandor dear monsieur nantoul can you explain how it was he troubled to remove his cloak hood and all and after that how is it he has left no footprints in the flower beds beneath the window one day darned you will see for yourself that my statement is correct though i have not verified it the flower beds are too wide too big for a man jumping from here to jump clear of them and the earth is soft enough to take and retain the footprints of a man who leaps down on to them from this height nevertheless such footprints are conspicuous by their absence monsieur barbey seemed overwhelmed aghast if fantomas did not escape by the window how then did he get away he asked fandor said in clear distinct tones fantomas was not able to escape but he cannot be in the room where then can he have hidden himself in a hard voice fandor made answer he is not hidden in the room you think then that he has hidden himself somewhere in the house speaking in the same hard decisive tone fandor asserted he is not hidden in the house in the very height of the struggle i kept a strict watch on the direction taken by the man who was doing his utmost to strangle me i am positive i had my back against the door when i fired so that exit was barred neither by door nor window did fantomas escape fandor's tone was one of absolute assurance if you are certain of that said nantoul can you tell us how fantomas did escape fandor's reply was to rise from his armchair he took the candlestick from the table where juba had placed it and walked towards a large mirror he carefully examined his neck very curious said he in a low voice now monsieur the man who tried to strangle me was fantomas we have seen him well this man had a wound on his thumb or more probably he wounded me anyhow he has left on my collar the mark of his thumb in blood you guess what this thumb mark is simultaneously barbey nantoul and juba rushed towards the young journalist fandor showed them a little red mark clear-cut on the white surface of the collar it was a fingerprint so characteristic that the two bankers cried in a trembling voice again the imprint of jacques Delon silence fell a pregnant silence the four men gazed at one another fandor soon started whistling a popular air juba smiled monsieur barbey was the first to speak good heavens do you mean to say that jacques delon was here in this room it is certain you say monsieur fandor that he did not get away either by door or window for pity's sake explain the mystery but fandor contented himself with a smile and a question do you really think then that i know it nantoul stamped with impatience but hang it all if you don't know anything don't let us waste time let us begin the search hunt through the house search the garden from end to end fandor went on his tone was ironic and warn the police well no monsieur nantoul we will not make any search whatever you can rely on that for the last three months we have been striving and struggling to solve a maddening mystery we never could reach a certain solution of it we have been vainly pursuing an assassin who for ever escaped us and now when for once we get a hold of a definite fact an indisputable reality are we going to risk muddling up the whole business not if i know it what do you mean demanded monsieur barbey listen replied fandor some minutes ago i was alone in this room jacques delon entered the room because i bear on my neck the imprint of his thumb jacques delon was fantomas because he declared it himself when he believed he would emerge victorious from the struggle jacques delon fantomas has not left this room either by door or window on the other hand you have entered the room you monsieur barbey you monsieur nantoul and you juba since these individuals have entered the room and no one has left it it necessarily follows that the personage jacques delon fantomas must have entered among you and that he has remained here between these four walls simultaneously barbey and nantoul raised protesting voices but juba continued to smile do you believe then 
but jerome fandor did not allow him to finish i do not think anything said he i know that i jerome fandor am i and that i am not jacques Delon. juve knows that he is juve and that he is not jacques Delon. you monsieur barbey you monsieur nantoux you know who you are and who you are not none of us can leave imprints similar to those of jacques Delon. but i also know that jacques Delon has entered this room and that he has not left it this is all that i know to this extraordinary declaration monsieur nantoux with an incredulous shrug of the shoulders exclaimed this is downright madness monsieur but juve congratulated fandor that's logic my boy you are going it strong lad fandor continued it follows that if jacques Delon has not left the room he must be here in this room he must be arrested in order to arrest him we must beg monsieur havard to come here as fast as he possibly can jacques Delon is fantomas or i should say fantomas is jacques Delon. monsieur havard will not hesitate to put himself to any inconvenience in order to effect such a capture i am going to call him up at once monsieurs thanks to this telephone and profiting by the bewilderment of his hearers fandor then and there telephoned to police headquarters he spoke to one of the officials who undertook to inform his chief that he was wanted at the telephone on most urgent business a minute or two later fandor was telling monsieur havard what had happened he terminated his narrative thus i myself had locked the door of the room in which the struggle took place no one left the room nor shall anyone leave it before your arrival i give you my word of honour on that come post haste it is of the utmost urgency bring a locksmith he must open the great door of the house he will have to force open the door of the room in which we now are i must keep an incessant watch over this room i do not see fantomas jacques Delon in this room but in this room he must inevitably be he is in it fandor listening to monsieur havard's answer repeated it to his companions in a very short time the chief will be here in a very short time monsieurs we shall witness the arrest of fantomas that is of the most inhuman monster that has ever existed it seems to me you are going too fast remarked monsieur barbey all is mystery yet you talk of making an arrest what do you consider mysterious now asked fandor laughing why everything take one thing do you know what were the motives of the different fantomas Delon crimes juve replied to this oh as for that perfectly the motives are clear as crystal madame de vibray was ruined and really committed suicide because you will pardon me i am sure because the bourse transactions you advised were not successful she poisoned herself and went to jacques Delon's studio to die perhaps she felt for him a secret attachment fate willed it that the assassins should choose this very evening to make their way into the painter's studio by means of this first corpse they created an alibi for themselves and prepared the scene which was bound to mislead justice and make lawyers and police believe in the murder of madame de vibray and the suicide of her murderer unfortunately for them Delon was discovered before the poison they administered had done its deadly work on him and Delon was arrested you can imagine the fury the distracted state of the guilty Delon had seen them he was going to speak at the legal interrogation very well then they will kill him and they do kill him but jacques Delon lives since his imprints are found here there and everywhere cried monsieur barbey fandor replied they kill jacques Delon since it has been formally established that jacques Delon was seen dead and once they have killed Delon, they think that a dead man cannot be arrested by the police and they accept this dead man as one of their band he they decide shall steal the pearls of princess danidoff this is a raving lunacy all that is pretty clearly proved monsieur nantoux it is he also who stole the millions in the rue de quatre septembre a sensational robbery which would have ruined your bank had not this issue of bullion been well covered by an insurance this insurance signified that you were no losers by this robbery in fact owing to an ingenious combination of insurances you have actually gained by the robbery as we are on this subject i might add that were i a member of the band i should propose restoring to you the vanished ingots robbers find bullion somewhat difficult to put into circulation you might buy them back then turn them into false coin for instance that would be all profit for you 
i wonder at you making such a joke as that remarked nantul please wonder at me to continue having carried out their plan successfully these robbers remembered something they had forgotten a compromising paper or something like it which had been left in elizabeth dollon's possession thereupon they send the dead man jacques dollon to look for it he attempts to murder his sister i arrive just in time to open the windows before she has passed all human aid meanwhile a series of cleverly arranged deals on the boers are brought off so that if thomery disappeared the barbey nantul bank would rake in important profits in haste the assassins get rid of an accomplice who is in their way that duffer of a jules the rue raffet servant and they send delon to kill thomery after that they decide to rob your bank which is stuffed with gold for were it not for this theft it would be your bank burdened as it is with thomery shares which would pay out to speculators the differences in value between past and present prices which amounts would have to come out of the money paid in the day before monsieurs with regard to this thomery's death did you a great service without his death which enriched you you would have had to settle up your sales by a certain date and you would have lost more than you gained at the moment owing to the sole fact of his disappearance i think you are very grateful to jacques dollon because of what he has done for you monsieur nantoul on hearing these last words rose he walked up to the journalist and said in a voice quivering with some emotion for my part monsieur fandor i think your way of explaining the dollon affair is a very strange way you assert that this painter is dead and you make him behave as if he were alive besides i have understood your words in truth what you say is senseless you make wild statements you have involved our bank in every one of the dollon crimes you have shown us as interested parties in all these robberies fandor said quietly nevertheless it is unquestionably true that you are the gainers by these crimes beginning with madame de vibray and ending with thomery madame de vibray might have brought an action against you for the loss of her fortune owing to your risky speculations and bad management thomery's murder brought down his shares with a run and you found that a most advantageous state of affairs you gained by it but of course this is coincidence since you are not fantomas since you are not jacques delon since you cannot imitate the imprint of his thumb i have only said this to show fandor stopped short hark someone is coming upstairs here is monsieur havard as the bankers were hurrying impatiently to the door fandor said in a bantering tone do not stir a step further i beg of you not a step let us receive the chief of the detective force exactly in the position we were not an hour ago when we encountered him whom the chief has now come to arrest barbe and nantoul returned to their former positions those in the room could hear voices on the other side of the door exchanging brief remarks the lock was being picked monsieur havard entered and hurried up to the journalist well my dear fandor i have followed all your instructions to the letter ah uh, you here too juva well speak anything fresh since your extraordinary telephone communication what were you telling me i was saying monsieur havard that the assassin had entered this room and assuredly had not left it that he was here here monsieur havard had recognized the bankers at the first glance his question betrayed a certain incredulity which piqued fandor here yes that is absolutely so because it is impossible that he can have left the room besides you shall convince yourself of that monsieur nantoul will you do me a small service will you draw a plan of the first floor of your house the banker rose and seated himself at his writing-table which was placed in a corner of the room i am at your disposal and he began to trace a plan a pretty rough one of the various rooms which made up the first floor of his house is that what you want he asked jerome fandor rose quickly and went towards nantoul the journalist's nerves must have been out of order in a jumpy state despite his apparent calm for in approaching the writing-table he suddenly staggered nearly fell tried to regain his balance and that so clumsily that he upset the contents of a large ink-pot on the writing-desk take care said monsieur nantoul who to save himself from coming into contact with this inky inundation threw himself back in his chair and lifted his hands above the flood of ink the banker repeated take care here is a fresh catastrophe but he did not finish what he intended to say quick as thought fandor steadied himself and before anyone could guess his intention he seized the banker's right hand pushed it forcibly into the wide-spreading ink 
then immediately after pressed it on to a sheet of blotting paper which took the hand's imprint quite clearly this imprint he glanced at but a moment like a flag he waved it above his head it is the jacques delon imprint he shouted the hand of monsieur nantoux whose characteristics are known in the anthropometric section has just left the imprint of jacques delon the journalist action created a momentary stupor juva rushed to him bravo bravo he cried but monsieur havard had gone quite pale he said in a low voice i don't understand barbey and nantoux retained their self-possession then monsieur barbey rose he looked fixedly at his partner he spoke in a tone of sad finality i suspected this farewell a shout of horror answered him he had drawn a sharp dagger from inside his coat and had plunged it in his heart up to the hilt juve knelt by the fallen man monsieur havard kept a sharp eye on nantoux here then is jacques delon the dead alive here is the elusive fantomas said the chief of the detective force but the bandit brazened it out as he recoiled before the chief why do you arrest me because of this imprint he demanded it is a piece of juggling on the part of this journalist take a fresh imprint of my hand my fingers my thumb and you will see whether my hand could possibly leave such an impression as that put on the blotting pad by some sleight of hand trick of this much too smart reporter he stretched out his arm in the direction of the blotting pad as though begging for a fresh trial fondor marched up to nantoux useless said he in a curt tone i have been watching you i know the trick nantoux stood stock still dumb fondor lifted the cuff of nantoux's coat and pointed out to monsieur havard and to juva a sort of thin film of glove-like form it was fastened to the wrist by an almost imperceptible piece of elastic this is human skin said fondor human skin marvellously preserved by some special process all its lines and marks are intact can you not guess whence it came do you need to be told whose dead body has supplied this phantom glove monsieur havard was as white as a sheet the body of jacques delon he murmured yes that is it there was a moment's intense silence in the room how do you imagine this wretch set to work demanded monsieur havard simple enough replied fondor fantomas knows the danger criminals run owing to the exact science of anthropometry he knows that every imprint denounces the assassin he knows that it is difficult to do anything without leaving such imprints and that is why every time he has committed a crime he has taken care to glove his hands in the skin of jacques delon's hands nantoul at bay attempted denial you are talking mere newspaper romance said he fondor looked the banker in the eye fantomas said he do not attempt to deny what is no longer possible to deny the trick is remarkably clever and you have reason to be proud of your invention perhaps i should never have discovered it if in this very room this very night you had not been imprudent enough to leave those imprints on my collar no one had left the room therefore the guilty person was in the room of necessity he was therefore it followed that someone had the hands of delon but how could this someone have the hands of delon of course naturally the idea of these gloves occurred to me fondor turned to the chief of the detective force monsieur havard madame de vibray committed suicide because she lost her fortune through barbey nantoux mismanagement she might even have been poisoned by them but that does not matter her death might compromise the bank they carried her dead body to jacques delon's studio and they tried to poison this painter in order to put the law off their track you know delon was saved he was a dangerous witness they killed him in his cell some warder being accessory to the fact killed him before his innocence could be established then they took his hands that they might commit murders with them delon is dead as i have held all along it is nantoul who has committed the crimes ascribed to the most unfortunate delon these crimes have profited the barbey nantoul bank as i pointed out just now whilst nantoul stood speechless whilst barbey whom they had lifted to a sofa was gasping out his last breath whilst juva was giving little nods of approval to what his dear lad was saying fondor was treating monsieur havard to a further version of the affair when i telephoned you i was morally certain of the approaching arrest not a soul quitted the room after the hands of delon had left the imprints on my collar and on my neck therefore someone had the hands of delon the finger imprints of all the personages present were known to me 
therefore someone had a method by which he changed his own fingerprints into those of Delon. how was it done it must be a remarkable method or means why of course it could only be by a pair of gloves that the trick was done of course it must be by means of a pair of gloves made from the skin of jacques Delon's hands i noticed that nanteuil kept his hands obstinately behind his back i guessed that it was he who had played the part of Delon tonight so i managed to prevent him removing those Delon gloves that i might take their imprint before your eyes the rest can be guessed can it not the imprint taken profiting by the confusion nanteuil slipped off the glove which as you see was no thicker than a cigarette when rolled up to throw it aside was risky he pushed it up his sleeve while pretending to arrange his cuff and at the same time to put ink on his ungloved hand and so hide his trick only i saw it all monsieur havard it is not only the false jacques Delon i denounce for juve and i fully realize that he is also the elusive fantomas here is this cloak with hooded mask which is an irrefutable proof besides he himself declared he was fantomas monsieur havard all you have to do now is seize this man juva and i will hand him over to you it was a thrilling moment juva and fandor in this hour of decisive victory mutely embraced monsieur havard advanced with raised hands towards nanteuil who retreated fantomas he commenced in the name of the law i are the word was strangled in his throat as he advanced another step nanteuil suddenly sprang backwards and his hand rested on the moulding of a wooden panel at the same moment monsieur havard as if hampered by some invisible obstacle stretched his length on the floor juva and fandor were about to rush to his aid but while fandor in his turn measured his length on the floor also juva yelled good lord we are caught he escapes whilst the detective made a frantic effort to move a step he seemed nailed to the floor fantomas quick as lightning leaped over the prone body of monsieur havard gained the door and banged it to behind him they heard a triumphant burst of laughter fantomas was escaping this is sorcery shouted the chief of the detective force in a voice hoarse with rage take your boots off take your boots off yelled juva who with bare feet was rushing through the house revolver in hand hoping to come up with the banker bandit but when the detective arrived at the entrance gateway of the house he found the policemen brought by monsieur havard chatting away quietly they had not seen a thing the street was deserted in a second fantomas had disappeared vanished into thin air he the elusive one had got away once more he had escaped those who were pursuing him with such keen determination it is very simple explained juva to monsieur havard and fandor who seemed deprived of speech yes it is simple enough i guessed it at once when i saw you fall monsieur havard just after fantomas had pressed the woodwork he pressed an electric button did he not yes fandor he established a current the wretch must have placed powerful electric magnets under the floor and the moment he realized that it was impossible to brazen it out any longer was on the very point of being arrested he established the current so we three were nailed to the ground by the attraction exercised by these electromagnets on the nails of our shoes he fantomas was then free to cut and run for it whose shoes must certainly have had soles made of some insulating material monsieur havard and fandor made no answer to this to have held fantomas at their mercy if only for a minute to have believed that they were going to lay hands on the atrocious criminal at last to have seen him slip through their fingers the thought of this almost brought tears to their eyes they were in a state of deepest despondency there's a curse on us cried fandor this time at any rate we have nothing to reproach ourselves with we could not foresee that then to himself in a low tone he added poor elizabeth how are we to tell her that we have let her brother's murderer escape end of chapter twenty seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 28 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 28. Courage. Have some more chicken? No, thanks. I am not hungry. But you should eat all the same. Are you eating anything yourself? Faith, I am not. Well, then 
in the private room of the fat pheasant restaurant where juva and fandor were dining silence again fell the two men sat motionless gazing into space they neither wished to eat food nor do anything at all they were depressed to the last degree they felt baffled they were sick of every mortal thing all of a sudden fandor burst into tears juva looking at his dear lad in such grief bit his lip his face with wrinkled brow wore a dejected worried look an hour or two previous to that fandor on returning to his flat had found a black-edged envelope the address in elizabeth dollon's handwriting fandor had opened it with fast beating heart and trembling hand for these past days an evil fate seemed relentlessly pursuing them now he feared to read of some fresh catastrophe he was reassured by the opening lines but as he read on and took in the meaning of elizabeth's words fandor felt as though his heart were bursting with grief elizabeth delon had written i seem to be going mad yes i love you yesterday i should have been glad to become your wife but there came by the same post as your letter another which contained terrible revelations proofs of their truth were given me i have not the right to curse you or rather i have not the strength to do it but never will i marry you jerome fandor you charles rambert footnote eleven see fantomas and the exploits of juva it seemed to fandor that everything was turning round about him he took a few steps staggering the weight of this terrible past a past in which he was the innocent victim but of which he could not clear himself overwhelmed him fandor cried in a voice of despair fantomas fantomas has taken his revenge and before the astounded portress the unhappy young man turned about and fell in a heap on the ground on the other hand shortly after the extraordinary flight of the banker nantoul to the world in general but fantomas to him and fandor juva had received from monsieur anion the supreme head of the police detective department who only manifested himself on sensational occasions a note sent by pneumatic post regret keenly that you revealed your personality in such ridiculous circumstances and that you failed to arrest a great criminal as juva read these observations he clenched his fists he grew livid with rage dinner was a mere farce for the two friends they did not dine they had no appetite juva and fandor went over and over in their minds the deplorable events of which all said and done they were the victims they gazed at each other full of self-pity they felt they were two derelicts afloat on the immense sea of indifferent humanity the worst suffering said fandor with tears of misery in his voice is the pain of love the most painful of wounds said jew bitterly is a wound to self-respect these two men every inch of them might have their moments of discouragement but they were a sporting pair of the finest quality fandor juva you are courageous i have courage juva very well my lad let us sponge out the past and start off afresh in pursuit of fantomas i tell you the struggle has only begun listen end of chapter twenty eight end of messengers of evil by marcella lane and pierre Silvestre. recorded by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com